way, did you want to start? Did you want coffee or something? I'm good. Okay. I'm good. If you want to, go ahead. It's 6.36 a.m. We are in a, a, a Dodge Ram truck, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, Drew has just picked me up um, from the James F. Martin Inn on Clemson University campus. Um, we're driving by, we're driving down a two-lane road. I see I, we just passed like a gray farmhouse it looks like on our right. Lots of little fence posts, a little orange sign, end road work, a yellow sign saying 30 miles per hour with like a plus sign above it. Is that or just an intersection? Yeah, just, coming an, up? just an intersection. I don't know my I don't know my US signs. The plus means drive faster. <laughs> the speed limit. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I, when I woke up, I set my alarm for 6 o'clock, I looked at the window, I thought, oh my gosh, we got we got to jump on it too early, but <laughs> but now it, the sun is not here yet, but the sky is, I want to say, what do you think, like a powdery blue? Yeah, a powdery blue with a little bit of blush thrown in. Ah, beautiful. And what, would you, could you describe the scene at all for what we're, what we're driving through and what we're seeing here and where we are? Well, we are, we are in Clemson, South Carolina, uh, which is in Pickens County, um, in the northwestern corner of the state, <clears throat> a corner of the state that used to be called the Dark Corner, um, because it was sort of the frontier away from the coast in Charleston and what most people know is South Carolina. But um, Clemson University is a land-grant institution that was... Um, that was founded um, in 1889 for the purpose of educating uh, farmers and the citizens of South Carolina, at least white landed citizens <laughs> at yeah. that time, um, about agriculture. It was an ag and mech school, so um, we're on the periphery of that, headed toward one of the university farms. And... Um, you know, surrounded mostly now by increasing development um, in this part of the state. As there are a lot of lakes here. There are no natural lakes in South Carolina, but there are a lot of hydroelectric lakes. What's a hydroelectric lake? Uh, a lake that was built uh -huh. um, to um, harness the power of rivers for water um, or for power, um, for electrical power. And, uh, and there's one lake here that's actually was built um, as a cooling lake for a nuclear station. So we have lakes here, which means we have um, some water birds. But this is sort of a funky time of year, Neil, because it's just... Oh, there was a cardinal that just flashed across. Yeah, I saw it fly across. <laughs> I didn't, it didn't have the eyes to identify like that, like you did. <laughs> What was it? What was it about? So a bird flew right across us. Where there's a forest on our right. Now we're going by Clemson Auto Parts on our left, and Presley Auto Service and an old and Jazzercise. And Jazzercise? Oh yeah, this like I was looking in a shed. There's a big gray sign that says Jazzercise. Now a Shell station. And, and so you, that that bird just whipped by, and you yep. you obviously saw enough of it to know what it was. There's a probably probably I say probably an American crow just sitting on the line there. And I say American because fish crows tend to be more social or at least gregarious this time of year. That lone crow just sort of sitting up there. There's a guess that I'm making because you don't want to really say anything about crows until they tell you who they are. Oh, I like that. You said 1889, the mm -hmm. university was founded. I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm Canadian, so the, this, this, the country, the 1776. <laughs> yeah. South Carolina was one of the first states yeah so tell me yeah. about the first so the first hundred there was a hundred years before before the universe mm, yeah well not so good for my people um until i you know i i i don't count um <laughs> i i count uh, juneteenth uh really um a few years beyond quite a few years beyond any sort of declaration of independence um, more than a hundred years past that, actually. Yeah. As um, as as true, sort of um, at least legal um, black independence. But um, yeah, South Carolina was one of the original thirteen colonies, and again, this part of the state was frontier for a very long time. Some people would still consider it frontier. Charleston is obviously where so many people what so many people think of when they think of South Carolina. Charleston on the coast um, is, you know, a burgeoning uh, 
city that where a lot of people want to be, but it was the center of commerce and trade, including in human enslaved traffic for a long time. That so, was a center point for the country. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, so much development of this country um, came on the, the backs of black um, Africans who were kidnapped and brought here, sold and traded as, as in, in the chattel um, market. <clears throat> so, you know, that's sort of the root of, um, of America in many ways. And, and the land grant institution here, Clemson University, was founded by a man who was um, a racist, um, who Thomas Green, not Thomas Green Clemson, but um, Benjamin Tillman, actually. It's Thomas Green Clemson's uh, land, in part, that was bequeathed um, to begin the university, but Benjamin Tillman, who was a populist, <laughs> racist politician who was able to uh, get on the stump and uh, foment uh, division um, founded the university and so it is in ways um, you know it has that beginning but then was desegregated in the mid um, 1960s in the early 1960s not late though yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Martin Luther Martin Luther King times. -ish. Yeah, yeah. So the civil rights movement and um, the demand by the federal government that segregation end is when Clemson University um, desegregated. It had been an all male ins military institution and um, went co-ed a little bit before that. So. It has a, a long, long history. Um, South Carolina has a long history of um, of separate and unequal, but things are uh, a little better now, hopefully, and getting better. I don't, I don't stay here for the politics. I'm here for the ecology, for family, for yeah, friends. Yeah. And, and hopefully yeah. to try to make things better. Yeah, yeah, you and you and you are, and I appreciate you opening that up for us so we could uh, touch on it uh, throughout the conversation a little bit. We're, we're driving down just to keep people posted. Uh, we went we went past a Mexican restaurant. Yes. Now we're going through like a little tiny administrative yes. district. The, the trees just really curl up and over the road everywhere here, though. So you you constantly feel like it's day and night yeah. you know, driving through. Yeah, this is Pendleton, which is a, a historic town just outside of, um, of Clemson, of south of Clemson. We're, we're headed east now into uh, the beginning of the day and we'll soon be out of this tiny town into farmland. It doesn't take long in a lot of South Carolina to sort of get out of, thankfully, to sort of get out of heavily peopled areas into into places that are um, a little less well kept, but this yeah. is we're heading now through this neighborhood. We'll pass a school on our left, cool. and then enter farmland pretty quickly after that. Little mailboxes on the edge of the road, uh, stone houses with U.S. flags uh, outside of them. Um, do you see a lot of Canadian flags like that? I do not. We do not. <laughs> we do not. Yeah, it's a. Um, <laughs> It's, yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh... Even though we love Canada, yeah, right? yeah. you know, it's not like it's, I, I feel like I, I, we're proud of Canada. Yeah, In fact, it's, the flag it's... was kind of repurposed for that. I don't know if you heard about that big trucker kind of movement last year where they kind of blocked up the roads uh, of the Ottawa mm -hmm. Freedom Convoy. Mm -hmm. That's the first time I, in a while in my life that you'd seen everyone kind of using the flag, but almost using it... Uh, you know, in a really kind of aggressive way, you know, like it, yes, you know, the flag was kind of it, it meant something different than when I grew up. Exactly, it's been co-opted. Same here, you know, it became um, as opposed to some sort of symbol of unity. Um, it, it became a pretty divisive 
pretty divisive thing. So, we'll go. so this is uh, here. This is mostly private land, but we'll be on university land here soon. These are little white houses, kind yeah. of uh, whitewashed, um, kind of like faded sides. Yeah, little rental units. Little rental units. And and by the way, I got I got my burger get up on. I don't know what to wear, so I, I got a <laughs> I got a straw hat. I'm wearing I'm wearing like a like a, a, a like a tan button up and tan I, I got these pants a long time ago I thought I got it now's a good time to try them out here what, what's your and you're drinking a Red Bull here you got yeah. a set of keys beside me you got we both got our, our binoculars yeah mine are, are Nikon I think yours are is that Swar- Swarovski yep okay yep. so Swarovski binoculars and uh, tell me what your kind of your burger attire is oh, or what, I, what hat. kind of what a do you, I, Sort of first come to thin pants, yeah, because I don't know where we might be walking if we walk. Tennis shoes, uh, a tie dye camo shirt, camo, yeah. yeah. So, you want to be dark, right? Like, you want to be dark for the birds, or yeah, I you know, I just kind of like to break things up, you know, I don't want to, I don't need full camo, I'm not going hunting or going to war with birds, so I just, uh, you know, it's just what what's comfortable. Um, I don't have on a big pockets vest or a tilly hat or anything like that. Not uh, that's sort of the unofficial in some places birder uniform. Right. I try to think. I've I've birded. Let's see. Uh, where, that's a morning dove. Morning dove on the wire. Yep. And a couple this more is, maybe. That is a northern mockingbird and then a cardinal. So there's three tiny black dots we just drove by on a wire. <laughs> All three picked out perfectly. I'm assuming you just recognize the silhouettes, so, yeah, so it's, they're second nature to you. Yeah, it's kind of a Peterson's field guide back in the day. Yep. You know, had those silhouettes of birds. But then I, I remember the encyclopedia that I used to stay in. Sometimes they're deer. I always want to slow down here because going down a hill, there's a little yellow sign. Bridge ice is before road. Uh, yeah, and it's hard to imagine any ice ever <laughs> uh, during these hellish summer months. But in the winter, that's you know mostly we'll get um, decent snows, or at least we sort of used to. Um, but February is typically late February, late January, early February. I look at that. There were two morning doves there. So this is University Farm land now that you're on. This is uh, actually tall, wet grass on both sides of us. Little fence posts. The grass goes far and wide. It's hilly. Dark trees on the horizon. Power lines and a that sort of a. Uh, faint salmon colored sunrise coming up above the trees there it's beautiful what type of forest is this uh this is um eastern deciduous forest primarily so um absolutely beautiful in in autumn um on drier sites the forests will be um comprised of a a little different mix and with some some pine trees some evergreens um thrown in it's a little university pond right there that uh, man-made pond yeah, yeah yeah that was uh dug uh for cattle we'll turn up here on steam coming Jones off Road. of it what, what's that called mist what yeah it's just it? a mist and that's uh, just the temperature change mm-hmm. just the difference in temperature between the air is cooler the, yep Turning onto a small bumpy road here. I was thinking, you, you know, you said um, I'm not hunting. I I did write down a lot of titles for you all over the place. And I wondered if you could define. I know it's funny to ask you this, but like, so the first one obviously is birder. How do you how do you define a birder? Ah, uh, man. Well, you know, someone who actively pursues um, wild birds for 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 pleasure, for inspiration. Um, and these days more than, look, these are crows coming at us here. Um, I tend to call myself more a bird watcher than a birder. And these crows will stop here on the top of this hill. Okay. Um. Something else landing on the wire there. Yeah. And that was actually a Eurasian collar dove, it looked like. 
and we'll just stop here underneath it. And I'm just gonna pull off. Yeah, tall, wet grass, barbed wire fences. The road's getting a little thinner and uh, crumblier. <laughs> And now there's no one in front of us, no one behind us, a couple sort of farm. What are those buildings called? The long, those, thin, low yeah, roof those buildings? Are all, those are all um, cattle barns. Cattle barns, okay. And there are some hay barns there. So this is the uh, University Beef Farm. Okay. This is called Simpson Station. <clears throat> and it's one of the university's research facilities. Um, you hear that? That's a Eurasian collar dove. Oh. Drew's just open the window so we can hear outside. There's a crow. Blue grow speak. There. Yeah, Eurasian collar does. What's the blue grow speak sound like? It's a warble, just this um so a blue gross beak. I Me. Mean, You're not going to sing that one. No, no, I'm, I'm not as I'm not as good at uh, at warbling as I am. <laughs> but your crow's probably pretty good. <laughs> not bad. It's, it's early yet. I heard you do the whipper well. That was impressive. You heard me? Yeah, really. I heard you with Krista Tippett. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I did do that. <laughs> um, all right, so. Now you've pulled up an app here on your phone. Yep, I've got to turn off my Bluetooth. Deny. That's the blue grow speak. Mm -hmm. I've never seen one of those before. Maybe today's the day. Yeah, maybe today is. Let's uh, get out and walk a little bit. Yep, absolutely. Because um, there's a bunch of other words too for you, but we'll get out and talk. <laughs> right. this, you, there's naturalist, hunter conservationist, cultural and <clears throat> conservation ornithologist, and songbird ecology I saw was your research focused on. So all these terms and definitions way, as we walk. Some animal crackers if you want them. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> 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 appropriate. Opening the car doors, I'm gonna strap my binoculars on me. Yep, there's a blue girl speak that just sang. <clears throat> Stepping outside here. I think that's the Eurasian collar dub on the wire right in front of us. Closing off the doors here. Oh, Eurasian collar dub's on the power pole right here. Oh. Down at it. oh, yeah, I see it. There you go. And they have that weird sort of screech. And this is a bird that's increasingly common here, but, um, you know, bothers some people because it's a quote unquote non-native species. Uh, as if birds observe political boundaries. <laughs> Watch out there. keeps and so there's another collar dove on the shed yes i on see the it shed on the right side is it called a eurasian collar dove because it comes from yeah, eurasia it's, yeah it's a it's an old world bird um across the ocean yes it's an old world bird that i'm gonna see if i can get you a blue gross beak here because it's one singing up here um and that if you listen to many nature african nature documentaries you'll hear that which is ah. a close relative um so native non-native yes that's uh that's an issue in birding and well, you were talking a, about that as the part of the history of this area as well it's an issue in um ecology right what's what belongs what doesn't belong what's native what's not native but you know you got to figure uh you're living in a a country of immigrants and you would think these are more morning doves look at that and you can tell i mean almost no neck it's really sharp tails but rapid flight and those are american robins actually 
that are just above those yeah. smaller birds. Yeah. <clears throat> so when when you see those, you know, twelve black dots in the distance, mm -hmm. you're you're going on the flight pattern, the the silhouette, yep. the all this stuff that just connects. Yes. Yeah, it, it's uh, you know, it, it's in 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 some ways watching birds is is pulling the birds apart, sort of in your head, and then putting them back together. Um, so, kind of this algorithm: if this, then that, and then maybe you're able to put a name to them. There's something up there, um, fluttering and then coasting. A little one black dot way in the distance there, the distance. almost like a swift or swallow Maybe. of some kind. Probably. It sounds like a chimney swift. Or doves. There's a blue jay that keeps calling. Yeah, I hear it. Oh, okay. So I love looking out here and you see the deer. Look in that far, far, far pasture. Yes, I see it. You'll see a line of white-tailed deer. Oh, beautiful, yeah. One, two, three, four, five, five, six. You know, there, I mean, in there you've got an animal that um, is native, right? At one time was almost um, hunted to extinction, but now is abundant. And some people would say over abundant. Um, you ask about some of my labels. I mean, it's an animal during the season that I hunt, that I eat, um, that my family eats. Um, anything that I hunt, I eat. And I figure it's the way to get um, organic foods without going to whole foods. So, uh, and, you know, I get to exercise my um, omnivorous option there. Is there. It feels like, you know, the birding and hunting, it, my gut says there's not a tremendous overlap. Am I wrong? I, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think the, you know, birding in a lot of ways, um, it's sort of, it's, it's sort of non-lethal hunting. Um, a lot of people want to think that it has no impact, but depending on who the birders are and how they're behaving, whether or not they are um, ethically observing, you know, boundaries or... Um, the rules of birding that say, you know what, try to minimize your disturbance to the birds so that you aren't creating a situation where the birds are being stressed or sort of taken out of their routine and maybe exposing them <clears throat> to stress or predation or something that would um, cause them not to, not to do well, um, not to be themselves, so to speak. Hunting, on the other hand, you know, I'm out there, you're observing both in both exercises, bird watching and, and hunting, you're observing um, behavior. Um, hunting, um, sometimes something dies, yeah. you know? Um, and birding, hopefully not. Um, so, you know, for me, that's where they overlap. I'm probably not a better deer hunter because I spend a lot of time when I'm supposed to be hunting deer watching birds. <laughs> <laughs> so I can get distracted um, from from that task at hand. But hunting is extraordinarily important to me because, again, it's sort of a way of recycling. Um, ultimately, Neil, uh, you know, when all my days are done, I hope that my ashes are spread out um, so that I get to produce stuff that the deer then eat. And, you know. Circle of life. Circle of life. Yeah. A little road here. There's always something. Drew's just picking up. Um, there we go. All right, Grimace's birthday. Grimace's chicken McNugget. Chicken McNugget box. As you're going, you're picking up litter. Well, I, you know what? It, even if it's just, you know, this, and uh, you know, the world is better by one less piece of trash. Exactly. So. I keep hearing this gross beak. I heard it up there first, now I'm hearing it here. Hearing it here. We're gonna... And the air is just beautiful. It's got to be, what, 50, 50 55, 60 uh, degrees? Yeah, it's, well, it's probably closer to, like, 70. Uh, this early? Yes. Wow. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get a lot hotter. Yeah, yeah. 
So is that what you mean when you say hunter conservationist? Yeah, I mean... It, it's, What's the difference between a hunter and a hunter conservationist? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm hunting with not just the intent of killing something. I mean, because by my calculations, when I hunt, I'm, I'm, I'm killing a deer maybe one out of ten times that I go. Um, is that all you hunt, deer? Yeah, yeah. Well, deer and... Uh, what else have I hunted? I used to hunt wild turkey. But I don't hunt wild turkey anymore because I couldn't, I couldn't, their, their legs are inedible to me because they're so tough. They're birds that love to walk. And so if I wasn't going to consume the whole thing, um, you know, why, why kill it? So, yeah, I, you know, I sort of always want to be able to respect the animal that I hunt, that I, that I kill by consuming it. Um. I don't, you know, hunting to me is not a quote-unquote sport. It's not a competition um, between me and the animal. <clears throat> it really is, a, you know, sort of a me trying to understand um, that animal in a way that mostly allows me to observe it occasionally um, to kill one and then to eat it. So... I, I feel like growing up in Canada, you know, getting food at the supermarket. I'm so far, so far <coughs> removed from the, you know, the kill, the killing, and the and the mm. sort of taking a part of an animal's body. Yeah, and yeah. there's just the distance between me and the stuff I eat is couldn't be bigger. It, it, you know, is that, you know, it, it, I I wonder about that in the world today. That's a huge part of it, Neil. I mean, we're looking. So you got deer on that side, right? And then you've got beef cattle on this side, uh, across that tree line. And allegorically, you know, you think all those cattle out there, they're fated. Ultimately, I mean, this, there's this pastoral scene of wild animals on one side that you could hunt. And then these animals, that's a bull bellowing, that are, are, are bound for a slaughterhouse. So That we domesticated 10,000 years ago. Right. And so there's protein on the hoof and a brown coat life figures protein on the hoof that's been bred selectively bred over generations and generations to produce meat most efficiently that we can then um <laughs> process in an industrial pro so those those cattle have no chance really um they they are they are destined and bound for that place those deer on the other hand um most of them will not die by hunters. They'll die by other means. Uh, some, unfortunately, will be hit by cars, or but but some will live lives, and what they have to look out for is predators, whether it be a coyote or, um, you know. So uh, you know, I, I look at those two things, and we make choices. It's not that I don't eat beef, um, but but eating deer and and understanding where your food comes from and how it comes apart rather than in a styrofoam tray that people will never... Grimace's birthday. Yeah, right. You know, chicken nuggets or steak, those don't blink at you. You know, you don't... So, uh, you know... It well, doesn't turn you into someone who doesn't want to eat meat, though, when you, when you, when you see the animal... Right, right. You know, like, I feel like if I hunted once, I'd, I'd become a vegetarian tomorrow. Yeah, maybe. I feel like you know. it would take me off of the... It might, you know, it's, but, but I've always asked fisher, you know, anglers, um, people don't have the same feeling about pulling a fish out of water for some reason. I mean, it's a living being that you're then pulling out of water, either clubbing over the head or maybe chopping its head off or, but people don't see the same sort of issues with fish that they see with, you know, warm blooded things, birds or, or mammals. Why is it? I think it's because fish don't blink. <laughs> Interesting. The less less human life. Yeah, I think if 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 a fish, if someone pulled a fish up and it blinked at them, they <laughs> people would have different feelings um, about them. But I, I think that's one of the big issues in conservation today is is where our food comes from. And so when I'm watching birds, yeah, some people that I know who watch birds also hunt birds. I mean, I hunted turkeys at one time. I, you know, waterfowlers, um, ethical waterfowling is one of the 
um, has been a big deal for conservation in North America, U.S. and Canada. So Ducks Unlimited and Wetlands Created and Habitat Conserved maybe one duck dies and that means that 10,000 or more um, live because of the habitat that's created or the duck stamp that's bought that goes to conservation. So, you know, it's um, it's black and white with a lot of gray in between. I was gonna say, it's so hard to figure it out because we're, we're our, by nature of our lives, we're, we're, we're just, you know, we're, we're eating, a lot of, most people are eating animals therefore we're taking their lives bird watching exposes us more to you know the natural world and you feel inside yourself a lot of pulls of how things work and yeah, yeah that well the, the you know what i like to think of the gray in between is gray matter which means hopefully that we're thinking um so for me you know that listening to that Eurasian collared dove call um, and then being able to relate that to African savanna um, and a bird that people say doesn't belong here in a country of immigrants right? And you're like oh, so you belong but the bird doesn't belong or whatever thing you choose to say doesn't belong belongs here it's this you know people talk about well um everybody came from somewhere everybody came from somewhere so there's so much to think about in these spaces um and and watching birds i get to think about it sort of in this way that you know the birds connect it right so i can think about beef i can think about venison i can think about wildness i can think about domesticated i can think about you know what's contrived um, I can think about um, identity, uh, the bird's identity. I can think about my identity. I can listen to all of these sounds in nature, and it sort of all comes together in this place. And I can wonder why people, you know, decide just to throw shit out of windows uh, as garbage instead of taking it home. Yeah, Drew's uh, bending over, picking up a plastic, it. another plastic bottle here on the side of the road. It's um, the sun's coming up now. In the distance, there's the the cattle. The cattle. Um, Look behind you. Look at that. Here it comes. Here it comes. So there's the the bright sun just peeking through the top canopy of of a little forest here. There's a bird going across our left to right. You know what it is. And yeah, I know. that's a. It's actually a European starling. Oh, that's a star. Which, yeah. Which, y you know, again, there's another bird, right? That was brought to this country to... I can hold that. Let me take that. Um, you, can use your binoculars. you know, uh, to, to approximate the <laughs> um, the European condition here. So people wanted starlings in America uh, as one of Shakespeare's birds. And so they brought them to Central Park in like 1890. And they turned out to be much more prolific and um, and intelligent than people gave them credit for. And they became, here's a car coming here. They became, you know, sort of bothersome to people because they're not native. Um, they were out competing some species for cavities and the like, so. Bluebirds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you see, there's a lot less bluebirds now. Yeah. So, I, I mean, but it's a bird that was brought here. Uh, a dark plumaged being brought to this country for the service of others. Hmm, where have I heard that before? Um, you know, that now is discounted. And you can, in this country at least, um, because starlings aren't protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, people can just kill them. What's the Migratory Bird Treaty Act? It's, uh, it's a, a treaty that was set up initially between um, the United States, Canada, uh, Mexico, Japan, to protect migratory birds. Not in Russia too, right? Am I right? Yeah, yep. So that these birds were... Um, you know, the, the wanton slaughter of birds that was taking place, you know, just sort of willy-nilly um, was curtailed. And countries agreed in this pact to protect migratory birds, um, to put seasons and limits on, on game birds, things like, um, you know, waterfowl or quail or pheasants, 
those kinds of things. But then the majority of the birds, passerines and wading birds, and um, to protect them. Passerines are just any bird that has uh, legs that can grip grip something. Well, Is that yeah, right? three, well, they have a they have a, a, a syrinx right uh, that's arranged in a certain way. Um, three toes pointing forward, one toe pointing uh, backwards. So perching birds, passerines, other birds have that that toe arrangement. But for passerines, what makes it unique are um, the voice, the 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 syrinx, um, the you're, song you're box. touching your throat when you say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So because I'm thinking about my own voice box, yeah. I'm wishing I had a syrinx sometimes. Um, syrinx. Yes, a syrinx. It's, it's not a voice box though. It's something else. It's a song box. It's a song box. <laughs> it's a song box. Let's think of it that way. So syrinx, um, toe arrangement, but also feather arrangement and some other. Oh, these are more Euro stars. Look at them. And uh, Euro stars. Yeah, European starlings. Oh, Euro stars. Yeah. So okay, birders yeah, yeah, will yeah, get. Yeah, you yeah. know, we'll go into this. <laughs> Coops. I heard you say. Yeah. There, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. Coopers hawks. So Migratory Bird Act. Not every country signed it, but a bunch of countries did. And yep. you can't kill migratory songbirds, but because starlings do not migrate, is that why you can kill them? Well, no. It's because they're not native, Neil. You know, they're not. I mean. Um, so you've got European starlings, you've got, uh, house sparrows, um, you've got, uh, the, the, feral pigeons, these collar rock doves. pigeons. Well, collar doves are protected. Um, they're, they're birds that have seasons. They're, they're again, so you can't just go and blast away at Eurasian collar does because someone has determined, well, you know, they're not invasive, they're not quote unquote harmful, um, and we kind of like them enough to only kill them at certain times. So, you know, those sorts of decisions that are made, you know, about who, if you remember Hamilton, you know, who lives, who dies, who tells a story, right? I, you know, I think about all that kind of stuff when I'm out watching birds because it's a matter of thinking about, well, who makes the decisions on what birds live, what birds die, um, and, and who gets to tell the story of, of what birds mean. And for the most part, it's, it's been one group of people who, who've been able to tell that story, mostly white men. Have been able to tell the to tell bird stories and to um, and to have everybody else relate to birds in the way that they feel they should relate to birds. And one of the things that I try to do in my work is to say, look, you know, we're individuals out here watching, and all of us have different bird stories. You know, maybe your bird story is Chicken McNuggets. Um, those are birds that ultimately became that process, that ultra processed food. 40 billion of them in the world. But you know, how many, how many kids the eating and dipping that nugget in barbecue sauce understand that it was a living being? No, yeah, exactly. You know, it, it just becomes, it comes out of the other end of the industrial complex as something that was picked up at a, at a, at a window and you get to eat it. Did it ever blink? Sure. I mean, and if you, you know, one of my bird stories, man, is is seeing one day I was out like this, but I was, I was in my truck and I was going down a road and there's something white in the middle. That blue grosbeak is going crazy there. You have to excuse me. I have, so I call it ODD. No. Ornithological distracted disorder. <laughs> I like it. But the, um, so I'm driving down and there's something white in the middle of the road just sitting there, but I could tell that it was, it wasn't trash. It wasn't, and I put my binoculars on it. <clears throat> And it was a chicken that had escaped from a chicken house. Huh. And it was just sitting in the middle of the road. And, but it was just sitting there, right? And I mean, and it what? it's not going to last long. Something eventually is going to get it. But it wasn't like a chicken you would see in a barnyard. It wasn't strutting around. I mean, because these chickens have been sort of genetically engineered and bred, right? to put on as much weight as quickly as they can. And so this bird is really, I mean, maybe half of its feathers are gone. Um, the tip of its beak had been clipped off. 
Oh yeah, Eurasian collar dove, you hear that? <laughs> yep, two Eurasian collar dove. Bigger ones. Yeah. And uh and it just sat there. <clears throat> and I and, and and it struck me that I was looking at this bird that it didn't have the capacity to survive beyond the chicken house or beyond the time that it would become a chicken nugget. Right. Yeah. And meanwhile, you're going bird watching. Meanwhile, I'm going bird watching, but that's a, that's a story. That's a bird story. Yeah. Um, so, what did it make you feel? Uh, it made me feel really sorry for um, that chicken. You know, and you see a, a truckload of those birds... You know, and you're like, man, I, again, I, I, I think I would <laughs> rather eat a, a, a bird that had a chance than these birds that are just sort of raised um, to become nuggets. Yeah. Or yeah. chicken noodles. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, I, I, I think about those kinds of things. I mean, and I think about fields of soybeans that become soy and tofu. I mean, then you're removing habitat for animals that could be wild. So, you know, um, there's 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 blood and tofu as well. So, I, you know, I don't there's think... There's blood and tofu. Interesting. Oh, yeah. It's certainly. <laughs> you know, um, that's an industrial process as well. So, I, you know, I think... I think about all of this when I'm birding. I think about all of it and I think about none of it. So I'm able to, you know, when I'm out by myself, see that chicken and to 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 feel something. Cause I was like, man, do I do I rescue this bird? Do I pick this bird up? Take it home somehow it, you know. But no, it's its legs are so weak. It it, it this chicken has been essentially designed to be what it is in this way it's been perversely thousands of generations removed from anything right. wild that could function on its and, own and, we've... and my thought was um and i said a little um i wished it well in a quick wild death that um some predator would come along and end its life quickly because there, there's no hope for it out there. It's not chicken run. It's not going to somehow magically um, become a bird that's able to survive in the wild. But that in those moments of freedom that it has from that stifling mass of its companions who are all fated to a conveyor belt death, that it ends that its life ends in the jaws of some wild creature it's salvation so i you know that's I'm, I'm by myself and all the wild birds that are around me and this chicken you know its story is what caught me that day um and and so i think a lot of that it for me is sort of again that gray that's between the black and the white of life or death or wild or domesticated or does it belong or doesn't it belong <clears throat> you never know what you're going to encounter um, when you're out watching birds if you take your binoculars down sometimes you see more absolutely i'm um, assuming one of your um i like how you say that salvation that's um one of your birder stories was when you were 12 years old, you crept into your brother's bedroom. Oh, yeah. Amongst the Playboys and the Kurt Vonnegut's, and you came yep. across a book. I want to just introduce one of your books here, A Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold, which I read and I loved, published by Oxford University Press in 1949. This... Uh, it's the mass market paperback now. With these silhou I have silhouetted Canada geese flying over a red sunset on my copy, but I think yours had this original dr drawing of three honking yes, Canada yes, geese yes. on it. It says a San County Almanac. A little blurb on the cover from the San Francisco Chronicle. We can place this book on the shelf that holds the writings of Thoreau and John Muir. Aldo Leopold was an American conservationist, ecologist, forester, and environmental philosopher who lived from 1887 to 1948. His writings emphasize the importance of understanding and preserving 
the intricate relationships between humans and the natural world. We say that as we stand just off to the side and the, the relationship between humans and the natural world goes right by us. <laughs> he believed in the concept of a land ethic. So I'd love to ask you what that means. This was a seminal work in the field of environmental literature, published posthumously in 1949, a collection of essays that reflect <clears throat> profound observations and reflections on the natural world, particularly at his Wisconsin farm known as Sand County. Dewey Decimal has filed this under 508.73 for natural sciences slash general science slash natural history. Drew, I'd love to hear about your relationship with the Sand County Almanac and how it feels into all your philosophical kind of thinkings about birds in the natural world. Uh, you know, Neil, I mean, you know, that is... The Sand County Almanac was probably my my it, well it was my introduction to um a land ethic someone else's land ethic i grew up with one because we we were on a farm and and we lived by what we were able to grow um you know what we raised in our own pastures or um or pens and so you know that leads you to a certain ethic when you um, or a way of thinking, um, a way of behaving, um, is how I would define an, an, an ethic. Um, and, and hopefully towards, from an environmental standpoint, bent towards um, doing things sustainably. That is that, you know, you take some, leave some for later, for others, um, essentially is, is how I define conservation. So Aldo Leopold was able to put how I was living <laughs> into words and putting how I was living into words was important because I could instantly relate to a lot of what Leopold was writing, this dead white man that I never knew um, in a place that I had never been. Um, Wisconsin, spent a lot of time there since then, even been formally associated with the Aldo Leopold Foundation as a board member. Um, no Aldo's, you know, last living daughter, Estella, um, Jr. And so in, in these ways, you know, Leopold sort of um, blazed a path for me. Yeah. For, in a literary sense, um, to, to be able to open that book up and to, to read the words, um, to see the art in the book that... Beautiful pen and ink drawings. Beautiful. And those, and it's funny now, you know, we're talking about the birds that belong, the birds that don't belong. When those, nobody's putting Canada geese on the cover of anything now because people see those birds as nuisances. Right, right. But I, you know, when I see Canada geese flying across, um, you know, an autumn sky and, you know, and I hear them honking, it still makes me think of wildness. And, but, but here we have just a few decades and an animal's character changes how people think about it it changes from you know um you know a sort of a sentinel and sign of wildness to we're afraid of wildness yeah we're afraid of it and and we want it on our own terms you can't have wildness on your own terms otherwise it becomes tame so you know what leopold did in a sand county almanac was really turn me on to that thinking, not to tell me how to think as much as just to say, you know, let's think about this in a way that's that's sustainable for us and for, for generations to, to come. And so um, not just going out and wantonly killing things because you can kill them, um, but if, if you're consuming it, then at least there is some physiological sort of compensation or realization um, for, 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 for what you've, 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 you've done. And so I'm, I'm consuming into my body um, as a hunter, um, as a living being, no matter what I'm doing, I'm consuming, right? Uh, but in reading Leopold, it was sort of this... Uh, it was this soul food for me that that really got to me in a way 
that said, you know what, let's think about the, the earth, the environment, <clears throat> um, and how we live in it in this, in this different way. And in thinking about it in a different way and relating to it, um, which is part of that ethic, how we relate to land, how we relate to other beings, not just human beings. I mean, that's critical, right? Leopold didn't dismiss that. Um, oh gosh, this deer are just beautiful and they're on alert. Because? Ah, and one of them. Because of us? No, they're just, uh, and one of them, the closest one, you see the bigger one? The darker one? Yes. That's a buck, a pretty big one. Um, and you know what, you know, what, what you get to see, you know, these, these are super adaptable animals that are, you know, living, you know, next to all this. They're living next to all of this. I don't know if my, I don't have my other camera. Let's see if my, my phone. So a land ethic is a relationship with the land. Wildness is a word you use a lot. And and you feel that we've we've lost our connection to to wildness. Absolutely. And and what what are the downsides of that? Um the downsides are disconnection. <clears throat> right? Let's go over here. I'm going to see if I can up. Oh, okay, see it's flagging off now. It hears Okay, so this, this here's an animal that knows it's learned. So it here's this four-wheeler coming down. And for all the traffics that, that's passed, these deer, look at them running. Yep. They understand that this, the soundscape for them changed. Yeah, a little that, a four-wheel kind of ATV is coming down a hill, and now all the deer are running up the hill the other way. And they understand that that's different, that that maybe presents a different threat than the sound of a vehicle that's... Because trucks have been going by, they haven't moved at all. At all. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And how can you discount that being as quote unquote just a deer? So, you know, it's, it's in, in watching them, that's again, one of the things I think that Leopold at least taught me is that to be observant is to, um, in some ways is to be almost worshipful in a way that you begin to know the ways of other beings. It's certainly a way of being respectful. And so that's, that's to me what bird watching is. It's a way of being respectful. Um, it's a way for me of sort of paying homage to evolution, <laughs> you know, and all the, the billions of years um, of, 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 of life sort of climbing from the slime, so to speak, um, into, into what it is. And so I can look at a bird and I can, and I can span all that time and all that space in that one individual. Um, I can look at those deer and I can think about how those deer were almost hunted to extinction, but here they are now, somehow they persisted you know, part of it, fortunately, is because there were people, have been people that have thought about conservation in a way and said, you know what, you know, it's important for us to <clears throat> to not kill all of these things, for us to have laws and rules that we operate by so that maybe we take some now, but we save more for later for those coming um, behind us. And so, yeah, it just sort of all comes together in that way. When we get connected with wildness, when we get <clears throat> reconnected with nature, when we see the intricate relationship between everything, there's a reverence there. Yeah. And and it, it seems to me to live, it manifests into a more a more content way of life in some sense. I mean, I'm, I'm extrapolating, but, you know, there's a peacefulness that comes with kind of ex exiting from that's why I wanted to fly down here and be with you in person you know I wanted to be out of the virtual tethers that we're all in 
I breathe mean, the air, see the see the see the beauty of it, and it, it kind of makes you. I don't know, for me, it makes me forget the stress of 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 everything else. Right, you know, for a little while, you know, I don't have to hear about, <laughs> you know, all of the trouble of the world. All it, you know, um, now some of it is here, right? You know, there's litter and people not caring. Um, but then maybe I make myself feel a little better by picking a piece or two of it up. Um, you know, I'm listening to, you know, birds out here and not listening to somebody pumping bad news into my head. Yeah. We've had these terms in our society over the last 30, 40 years, you know, racist and then ableist. And I feel like this, I feel like speciesist mm. is going to be a new one because we're so speciesist today. Yeah. We're so oriented around our species. But when you see where I'm from, a common loon, you think about 40 million years, mm-hmm. 50 million years, you know, it's mm-hmm. the non hollow bones, it's dinosaur history. Yeah. And, and you, you know, it's, it takes you out of, out of, out of uh, people and it makes you, it makes you feel much more connected to everything else and less worried about it all too. Plus, it helps that you're out outside and getting all the benefits of, you know, phyton size, and they lower <laughs> they lower your adrenaline and your cortisol. And you know, there's questions I had from this book I was going to ask you as you just the silhouettes are, are from from our bodies are now long kind of <laughs> against the edges of the grass and through this wired fences and we're coast we're kind of look, you're looking with your binoculars education you know we're kind of on the land you said of Clemson University on page 20 of the book Leopold writes I once knew an educated lady banded by Phi Beta Kappa who told me she had never heard or see I've seen the geese that twice a year proclaim the revolving seasons to her well insulated roof is education possible Possibly a process of trading awareness for things of lesser worth. So you're the alumni distinguished professor of wildlife ecology at a at a wildlife based, you know, or animal based university. From your vantage point, like, what's the relationship between education and our awareness of 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 nature? You know, are, are, is that true? What he says on page twenty that we, the more educated we are, the less connected we are with everything that's around us. Well, I think education can be a box, right? If we, we can build boxes around ourselves um, with degrees. And, and there, there are degrees of education, um, but there are also degrees of learning. And, and I would hope that education is a way to open the boxes so that th- those degrees don't become sort of shackles. But in many cases, I think, and, and when I say shackles, um, not that education, um, you know, I, I, I think at times, Neil, that what it does is that um, we become experts at something, at some one thing that, look. Big bird in the distance flying towards us. Red-tailed hawk. Young bird. Wow, it's beautiful. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. Where are you going? Maybe to the shade here. So I'm going to land here. Oh, there. On the tree right behind. A lot of other birds are yeah. heading the opposite direction now. <clears throat> yeah, they're, uh, and you've got birds that now are going to mob it so that everybody knows where it is. And these are, um, meadow larks here that have flushed up so earlier in the year you'd hear them sing but now they're just uh they've sort of gone silent in this late summer landscape but i so yeah i i I do agree that that education can sort of put us in boxes it can shackle us and for science what it's done for people who do what i do um who were brought into this whole thing because they love land like this or watching birds or um or 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 hunting deer or or just being out that they became experts and suddenly that's an east that's an eastern kingbird right behind us right there oh yeah eastern kingbird what's it doing when it flies up to me or you said you said um it's a fly catcher but there was a barn swallow that it just decided it didn't like or it, it, it didn't want in its space um that was a judgment call saying it didn't like it 
Um, but it just, you know, kingbirds, it's a swallow. It's like, it's like maybe a rough wing. Yeah, looks like a northern rough wing swallow. Um, <clears throat> this whole know, time we haven't moved an inch. No, uh, and it's, that's, <laughs> that's the thing, Neil, you can, for me, and that's why I say bird watching more than bird, being a birder. Um, is that bird watching for me is sort of this um, more intention time with not just um, the birds but with the space and um, and letting the birds meet you as opposed to maybe you seeking the birds because they'll they they sort of find you you know and if you're in a space and if you're um you slow your pace i've found that you know you'll see things sometimes that you won't see if you're sort of on a directed march to find um so um not saying that one interesting you'll see some if you're on a directed march you see less in some ways I think. I mean, yeah. you, you know, here we get we get to feel a nice, cool breeze. We get to feel the sun on our backs, while it's still pleasant to feel the sun on a um, in in August. We got to see deer. We've uh, we're we're hearing and seeing birds um, in a way that's different than if we're on that forced march to see one thing right <clears throat> or to list a lot as many things as we can you don't list anymore i heard no not really you, i you used to make lit you know so for people yeah. who don't know you know bird watching it people have like accounts with merlin and an ebird and they make lists and they keep a life list i do and um you've gone away from that I, you know what? I write poems. <laughs> so that's probably the way that I list now. So I, I list experiences more than species. Um, and uh, yeah, I keep, I keep mental track of the birds that I see and I understand, and it's, I'm, I'm no less, oh, look at that Easter meadow lark just sort of coming down. There. Yeah, coasting almost. Yeah, coasted down and they, you don't see it. But that bird has this lemony yellow breast with a black chevron and it's actually a black bird it's but only one part of it is is black but you hear that little sort of burp 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 in there but they're all in this grass right um and if we had been on some march maybe to see the blue gross beak we never would have seen this bird as you said beautifully said just sort of coasted in and disappear and <laughs> and uh but it's there so that gives you an opportunity to sort of, then my question is, wow, that bird just sort of coasted in there, settled down, I can't see it. How many are out there? Right. You know, right. what's that world like in that grass? And then that leads me to the next question. So this is human created pasture. What if this was native warm season grass? What if this was converted to Piedmont Prairie? How much better would that be for eastern meadowlarks or eastern kingbirds or blue grosbeaks or whatever birds there are? And so then that part of me, that scientist part of me, then begins to think, okay, how, how can I make this better for birds? Can I make it better for us? Um, and, and so that's education to me. That's learning to me. And a big part of learning is not just responding to questions, but asking questions. And, and so when we become experts at, at something, sometimes it leads us to believe that we have all the answers. And we, we, we hardly have any answers. Um, now, one of, the big ans one of the big answers that we do have is that we're fucking a lot of shit up, right? Um, and, and Bird populations declining everywhere. Yeah. The canary in the coal mine is a metaphor for the whole the whole population uh, yeah, of birds. Yeah, for, for flocks of canaries just sort of disappearing in thin air. So, you know, how do we do better? You know, and that's, a, that's again, a, a sort of a part of that Leopoldian land ethic. Um, you know, his, his quote of conservation being a state of harmony between people and land. I mean, that's critical, right? You know, what do you hear? So when you think of harmony, how do you, how do you, how do you play along with someone else? What's your instrument, 
right? Maybe your instrument is science. Maybe it's art. Maybe it's writing. Maybe it's dancing. Maybe it's singing. Maybe it's uh, <laughs> maybe it's even being a policymaker. Um, but if if those are your instruments, then how do you play together in some harmonious way? So uh, you know that's that's to me sort of the essence of. Of, of who it is that, that we are or can be. We figure out what our instrument is, um, then hopefully we play it harmoniously so that we have Eastern metal arcs in the future for people to hear sing spring of the year, or we have blue gross beaks that warble down a fence line and people don't have to say, yeah, blue, the last blue gross beak was heard you know, in 2030. Right, right, um, right. And no one has seen them since. Because bird since. species, are, we're going to get to another book where we talk about extinction a little bit more specifically. Yeah. It's interesting, too, on entertainment, too. Just, uh, you know, there's a quote on page 36. He has this really beautiful, evocative, multi page description of the American woodcock's mating uh, ritual. Uh. Right. And he writes The drama of the sky dance is enacted nightly on hundreds of farms, the owners of which sigh for entertainment. But harbor the illusion that it is to be sought in theaters they lived they live on the land but not by the land yeah just so 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 change theaters to streaming exactly phones and, and, and yeah man and here's <laughs> leopold right writing this back in the 20s 30s and and, and 40s and it's still relatable today Maybe more so. Maybe more so. Yeah. And I, and People probably don't know what an American woodcock is. I didn't until for. I mean, I'm starting to get into birding now. I'm like, I see it in a picture of a, a nature field guy. I've never seen one yeah. before. I still haven't seen one before. Well, let me tell you, it's it's you'll you'll when you see woodcock, you know, and you'll see them do the funky sort of bounce, sort of dance. You know, they 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 bounce, then they walk a step, then they bounce, and they do this funky thing. Um, but to hear a woodcock, to me is the essence of understanding a woodcock because you'll hear them do that Twitter sort of rising and then you'll- Got your hand in the air. Yeah, and then you'll hear them hear them falling, right? And the, the wind winnowing through um, their feathers and you'll hear that pink, 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 pink. And then you're like, ah, I get it. I get Leopold now. I get what he meant. And um, so sometimes, man, it's it's not even, it's what you can see, but it's more, you know, like Rachel Carson said, it's what you can feel. And, um, you know, and, and, and she, for me, fits sort of hand and glove um, from a philosophical standpoint, at least in terms of what, in the way that I think, and the way that, uh, you know, I sort of process things out here. Um, you know, there are a number. There are a number of sort of mentors that I've had, and Aldo is is just one of them. I mean, he's key among them. But Thoreau, you know, Thoreau wasn't afraid to talk about the 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 prevailing politic of the day and the issue of the day, which was enslavement. And man, he spoke out um, passionately about as as an anti-racist and an anti and, a, and an abolitionist about. Uh, the sins of enslavement and what it would cost this country. But then he could talk about, you know, a walk around Walden Pond. He could talk about a wood thrush or a woodchuck. Um, he could talk about all these things. Um, and it just, it just broadens that person to me. So, you know, part of what I, I hope that, that people are able to do over time is again, take down their binoculars and, and, and see the, the broader view. Nature as entertainment is an interesting concept. I mean, there's people advocating, you know, it's, it's, it's free, it's around us, it's there. But, you know, with TikTok and, and social media, these things are just so perfectly wired to our dopamine centers. <laughs> yes. It's almost like you don't have a chance. You go outside, it's boring. It's boring. Right. It's relatively unstimulating than being constantly titillated by, you know, endless scrolling. Is, you there, know what, is you, there a chance? Does nature have a chance? You know what I want to do? This is this is how I'm gonna. So this is my this is my this is my capitalist moment, right? I think I'm gonna invent like binoculars, but it'll have like a virtual sort of screen, and and what the the screen what it does is the binoculars frame real life in kind of a 
TikTok-ish frame. So then you think you're watching a, a reel, but you're watching what's real, right? And then people are hooked and they don't know it. So I want to do that. And so Neil can say, yeah, I remember when we were having this conversation and, yeah, and Drew just sold this patent for, you know, seven billion dollars. <laughs> So, <laughs> but how do we? How do you make? How do we make nature more appealing? It sounds funny to say that. And maybe it's the tick. Maybe it's the binocular invention you're talking about, where it puts it in a square scrolling screen. But mm-hmm. you know, um, I, I worry about it for my kids. You know, we're, we're living in downtown Toronto. Uh, we have to like go somewhere yeah, to, yeah. to see nature. You have to like make a pilgrimage to get into the forest. And once you're there, and the, my kids, you know, they take to it after a minute or two. But it's 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 hard work to constantly. It's, be introducing them to what's around us yeah because you know we've been well first of all we've been told that nature is out there um and it, it's not it's really all around us i mean you can find space i mean i've been in the heart of manhattan and looked up and there's a peregrine falcon right um yeah there are pigeons and starlings and house sparrows and guess what they are nature um and, and, and how those beings, we were, I was driving through or was being driven through Chinatown <laughs> a couple of months back. And here I'm sitting in the back seat of this car. There's an Easter metal arc just saying. <whistles> they're not singing a whole lot now, but that was just beautiful. Because they were singing to Maze. Yeah, yeah, but they're not mating now. No, so he's just no. singing. Yeah, it's, because, it's just postseason, and so why got, is this singing now? Then? Well, you got a few birds that they, they yeah. still have hormones surging. Um, yeah, and then I just heard a dick sizzle back there, which is weird because I thought the dick sizzles had moved out of this field. That's cool, but we wouldn't have heard that if we had been marching yeah. to and from. Yeah, um, Manhattan. So here we are. And man, it was just crazy. I was just like, all the people, right? Here I am, this rural guy, and I'm like, just, and I had just been driven down from Vermont in the middle of nowhere at Middlebury. And here I am in Brooklyn, and it's all these people. And then I look, and there are these pigeons, right? And I'm like, wow, these pigeons in the middle of all these people. And that's nothing unusual, but. You know, then I started thinking, so what are these pigeons thinking about, right? Um, you know, there's probably a peregrine falcon somewhere around that, you know, is going to turn pigeon into peregrine. But those pigeons, which a lot of people would think of as the least wild of birds, birds that aren't protected, here they are. So why not take the opportunity? There's a bird story right there. I mean, pigeons are signs of, of love because they're a dove, uh, of peace, of all the things that are supposed to be good, but we've taken pigeons and forgotten that they're doves. So take the opportunity. Keep going on that. What makes pigeons special? You're, I like this real little Well, they're ball. powerful. Watch a pigeon's flight, and you'll see one of the most powerful flyers um, when you watch a pigeon fly. If you watch a flock of pigeons and you watch how they coordinate, um, understanding that pigeons have been awarded medals of war because they were delivering messages across, you know, they've been shot at, they've been wounded, they've been killed in service, serving humanity. But here we've made the decision that they're not worth protection or worth being birds. Well, everyone so. in downtown Toronto, or not everyone, but we look down on pigeons. I oh, mean, if every, I mean, where do people look? I mean, maybe you know, uh, you know, uh, in you know, in the Basilica in Rome. I don't know, um, in the Vatican, rather. Maybe that's where people look at them. In the city. <laughs> Red tractor just drove by us. I, I love this with the mower on back because most of these people out here, you know, we work for the same agency. We work for the, for, for Clemson. Um, but part of what's disappearing is this life, you know. In, in so many places, Neil, uh, if this weren't 
state land, if this weren't university land, somebody would have designs on jamming as many houses in here as they could. Yeah, yeah. Luxury condos. Y- yes, <laughs> yes. And, and, and there's probably somebody um, in the university that's thinking, wow, how could I convert this to something else? How could I take this out of this and make money, more money with it? And, and so I, I think when we're told that nature is far away and kids learn, well, nature is only on the African savanna and we've got to go, or it's in a national park, or we've got to go far away to see it. It's cool to go and see it by degrees, but I think because we have relegated nature to the far away, that it's become harder for many people to relate to it. Yeah, and the, there's the, uh, you know, in, in Toronto where I'm from, there's this big protected green belt surrounding the city, and mm-hmm. now the, the provincial government is saying, oh, we've got to encroach on that and build houses. Is that happening right now? There's debate, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. people are fighting it, but, uh, you know, the, the, the push from the other side is, well, there's more people want to live here. We need, we need more homes. More, there's more immigration. There's more, you know, there's this other push that our lives matter more, and, and mm-hmm. we, we have to we have to go somewhere and there's this there's this push against against nature against the spaces that we have yeah 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 i you know i mean and population's growing and there there's no more land being created um you know and these are things that we have to think about makes you want to move somewhere like this so that's why (laughs) well i (laughs) come down here you're like i could i could get into this look uh you know we just bought uh, my wife and I just bought a a little farm. Um, well, it's 45 acres. Oh, congrats. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's not very far away from, you know, the other house where we were living, but being in that space feels like, um, first of all, it's a privilege to be able to do so. So to acknowledge that privilege is one thing, but then I feel like it's also kind of coming home to Leopold in a way, in that Leopold had that farm as an escape, but it was also probably his um, biggest classroom and that it allowed him to to learn and, and for the land to educate him, <clears throat> you know, sort of back to this education thing in a way that, you know, is still relevant today. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if, if your, your kids, you know, they they're in a world of scrolling and you know the attention span of a reel and most reels are what less than a minute well now now they're six seconds eight seconds nine seconds yeah and and so yeah. when people spend when they come home from school singing songs from memes because their friends pass them around there you, you go. know wouldn't it wouldn't it be great right um now if i can and and you can you know the algorithms if you do it the right way i suppose you can have algorithms that are mostly bird song or scenes of wildness and maybe that triggers something different i don't know but you know the sad thing is that what we can't do now is just tell people oh put your device down and everything will get better because that's not going to happen um so so how do you alter the algorithm how do you play that game and that's a dangerous game right um to say okay you know what rather than have people sing doing this how about I introduce them to this? And, and, and so part of what I try to do in my ornithology class is when students are out, I'll, you know, the old guy, old professor me would say, you guys leave your phones at home. Don't bring your phones out here. I say stuff like that. You know, Plug your phone downstairs. Right. I say, don't put it by your bed. But guess what? When you're out here, if you've got your phone, you can take pictures, mm-hmm. right? You can record. You can post that. You can post a reel from out here and maybe people see it. And 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 those kids, is that an Eastern Bluebird? Yep. Oh, on the wire there? Yep. Oh, nice. Female Eastern Bluebird, more than likely that sort of brownish color on her back, grayish brown. And then that is, that's a younger Eastern Bluebird. You can sort of see some of those spots. So what you're beginning to see this time of year our family groups of eastern bluebirds that have fledged earlier. This road actually was one of the places where I did my earliest research. There used to be bird boxes here. And um, 
and 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 my uh, my eco feminist um, mentor, Dr. Patty Gawadi. You know, we'd be out checking those bluebird boxes, and this is one of the roads. So I, I you know, I've been I've been watching birds, Neil, on this road since like 1985. Wow, that's oh god, that's a long time. That's what 40? No, it's 35. Gosh, how long is that? Is that yeah, 30 uh, 38. Years? 38 years. 38 yeah. years. 39 years. <clears throat> so, but anyway, yeah, I, I think um, we we have to figure out a way to get to kids that doesn't separate where they are from nature. Um, and, and again, you know, we started off talking about food and part of that is food. You know, it's probably going to be a disgusting conversation, but the next time you go through a drive through window and your kid gets a grimace meal or you get it, you know, and you say, you know where that came from? <laughs> and, and, and just to ask that question, because I heard, I can't remember where, but there was this disturbing statistic that Gosh, it was something like four out of ten kids in this survey thought that bacon came from a plant. Oh, interesting. They didn't know that, you know, a pig had to die for them to eat a slice of bacon. Um, and that's disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. That's disturbing. Yeah. When people... We don't want to talk about it. It it, it grosses us out. (laughs) Look, I mean, and, and, and even then, you know, I mean, it's sort of like when, when, you know, we used to watch nature documentaries that were more than six or eight seconds of a reel and a lion killed a a zebra, you know, I mean, people were, oh, this is what lions do. Now it's become sort of, there have to be warnings about it. You know, this predator may kill prey. You may want to avert your eyes, and then you get to see the lion sort of, you know, animated, living shoulder to shoulder with zebras and talking to them in a way that, <laughs> you know, would have you believe that lions never kill zebras. I wonder if part of what helps kids learn more i'm thinking about my own kids and i'm also thinking about you is our, our field guides because you 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 said that one of your most formative books is this birds of north america field guide a field yeah. guide a guide to field identification by chandler s robbins but it was originally published as a golden field guide uh, yes you know that curly cursive little golden book font at the top a bright red birds with of north america <laughs> below and a photo of three bald eagles and the phrase a guide to field identification below the back of the book's really fascinating on this one it says spot the silhouette of a northern is it goshawk hawk goss goss hawk goss in hawk. flight identify the raucous call of the red winged blackbird discover the secret of picking out a chipping sparrow from its look-alike cousins it's simple with this classic field guide a treasured favorite among amateur bird lovers and exacting professionals chandler s robbins was an american ornithologist mm. and i'd love you to define that that's not one of my my words i don't quite know he lived from 1918 to 2017 and he accomplished many things including writing this guide, creating the North American Breeding Bird Survey, and negotiating a treaty with the Soviet Union to protect migratory birds. You can follow this guide under 598 for natural sciences slash zoology slash birds. I'd love you to tell us about your relationship, Drew, with with the Birds of North America Guide (laughs) to Field Identification. It was the first field guide I ever owned, Neil. I, you know, after the, after the Leopold. Yeah. Like, after, not that that's not a field yeah, guide. I, yeah. I mean, but I, you know, I saw that book back in the, I don't know, it had to be in the mid seventies in a bookstore window in Augusta, Georgia. Right. And it was back then that first edition was like, um, Brown this, and it had a flexi bound cover. So that was sort of neat, but it had like, um, buntings on the front. It's like a painted bunting, which is a bird that's going to catch your attention anyway. Um, But I I would see this book on display in this bookstore window and I would stop and just sort of stare at it. I mean, there was no internet to check out. There was no Amazon. There was nothing like that. And I wanted that book and it was $4.95. And most of my allowance came in quarters or I would, um, I would, I would return bottles for the deposit, you know, a nickel for a bottle or that kind of thing. 
And so I had to save up $4.95 for this field guide. But I remember being distraught because I went by that store one day and the book was no longer in the window. Oh, my God. And my little, you know, um, 10-year-old brain was like, there are no more of these books. Right? right? Yeah. It's gone. They have it or they don't. Yeah, right. How, how would you, how would I get a hold of this book that I was worshiping? You know, it's sort of like, um, you know, like in a Christmas story when Ralphie is looking through the window at that Red Ryder BB gun and he just lusts after this, this little BB gun. Um, well, I was lusting after that field guide, but then when I, I did finally, it reappeared and I finally bought it. I just lived in that field guide. I lived in that field guide, just looking at the birds, looking at the range maps, looking at the sonograms, which are these little depictions of, of the bird song graphic. You could read those? Things? Yes. Really? Yeah, I they, looked at those in the God. I couldn't understand them. I mean, it was just, just sort of natural to me. I don't know why, yeah. but I got it. Really? I got it. Yeah. You know, it's and, like a drawing of, it's like a musical. Yeah. It's like a music, yeah. music notes. And, and in, in part, it was, there were bird songs that I already knew. And when I looked at the, you know, when I looked at the sonogram, I was like, oh, yeah, that is what that bird's song looks like. And so um, that's 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 when I, I think the ornithologist in me was cast, you know, just someone who who not only appreciates birds for what and who they are, but who studies birds with the intent of advancing the science of bird study. So, yeah, we're we are bird brains. Um, as ornithologist, Chan Robbins is a hero. I, I met and had the chance to meet him once at a meeting, and I think I probably stammered all over myself because here's here's Chandler Robbins, right? Um, you know, who who got so much of sort of modern bird watching and birding and and ornithology with um, the breeding bird survey. I did a breeding bird survey for years. And felt like I was. What's that? What is a breeding bird survey? um, It's a 50 mile route that you drive, and um, well, actually, you you have this this route, this prescribed route that you drive, and you stop every half mile, right? So you have 50 stops, so it's actually 25 miles, and you stop every half mile. You get out. You look and you listen for birds for three minutes. Then you get back in your car, you drive to the next stop, and you do that on this prescribed route. I've got a friend, David Bradshaw, who did, who's, uh, gosh, I think he did a route for 40 plus years. So, um, looking for breeding birds. Yeah, looking for breeding birds. And it's the way that now people are doing it more with eBird. Yeah. Um, The breeding bird survey still exists, but, 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 eBird is a complement that allows us to draw maps of birds, um, to understand range changes, to understand a little bit about populations, um, even though, I mean, you have to index through things like eBird and, um, and breeding bird surveys give you a little better data um, in some ways. But, you know, they're just these ways of having multiple eyes. Ornithology as a science really depends on the amateur. You know, um, and and so that's why it's important for birders not to just list, but to think about, I mean, how do you make birding sustainable? And I never really hear people talk about that. Um, Unfortunately, there are a lot of birders who aren't conservationists. They just want to enjoy the birds. They want to see the birds, but they're not thinking about how do you make birding sustainable? That means there are birds... (laughs) left to watch you know we talked about take some now leave some for later as there was a candy lot right now our leaders back in the day and never thought i'd come around to conservation but take some now leave some for later watch some now conserve some for later how do you do that do you just go out and watch birds and say oh i went birding today i'm gonna go birding tomorrow without ever thinking about conservation and a lot of birders do that it was shocking to me to find out how many birders aren't conservationists, don't think of themselves as conservationists. Um, they think just simply by going out and watching the birds that they are conservationists, and they aren't. Conservation is not a passive thing. It's an activist thing. So 
you know, I like to promote that activism. Chandler Robbins. How does someone go down that line? A birder listening to this, they're, they're like, okay, I want to get... Do, do something other than watch. You know, um, join an organization, give money to uh, a conservancy that's conserving habitat, that is actively working to keep land from being developed that is wild. Um, think about how you introduce someone who isn't like you, who doesn't have your privilege of, of, of some identity, perhaps, to, to think about nature in their own way. You know, and so that, that mode of the activist, again, is something that I, I think we've, we've lost as conservation scientists. Um, conservation doesn't mean conservative um, to me. What it means to me is that I've gotta have a voice, I've gotta speak out about things that I see, that I feel. <clears throat> and if I speak out about the things that I observe and the things that I'm feeling, maybe that has an impact on someone else. So if you're a poet, <laughs> you know, maybe your words activate someone else to think about something other than putting a tick mark next to a list or it makes them think about doing something other than developing their eBird list in competition with someone else. Maybe they begin to think about eBird in a different way or maybe they begin to think about their lists in a different way or maybe they begin to think about how you activate someone else's heart and mind towards conserving birds, towards conserving nature. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, um, it's not hard um, to, to be an activist, really. You just have to do something for someone else other than yourself. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't have to march. Going you, from seeing to seeing and doing. Right. Yeah, uh, and, 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 and thinking a little... Hard to know where to start. I mean, for a lot of people, you, you said join a, you know, join, a, join a group, give some money. You know, I, it, it seems like it's, it's a pretty granular, fragmented place, Nature Conservancy. So it, where would you point people to start or, or when it comes to birds? Are there certain organizations that you see as leading, leading, leading the cause? And how do you do so in a way that is, you know, where do you go? How do you start? Start close to home. Start close to home. So if there's a conservancy close to home, if there's a park close to home, um, if there is a neighborhood association um, and, and you have a chance to have a voice in that neighborhood association where someone is saying, you know, um, we need to get rid of this pocket park so that we can pave it over and have more parking spaces. No, argue for that pocket park. Argue for that community garden. Um, you know, advocate for connecting people to nature in a way that they wouldn't otherwise be connected. And you can, everybody's connected to nature through their stomachs. Everybody's connected to nature through the air that they breathe. Everybody's connected to nature in all of these ways um, that we ought to be thinking about. That's the, you know, there's the, the, the black and white of life and death and in between is everything else that you know that's our existence that we ought to be thinking and feeling about yeah so that's the activist part of it man um it, it's you know people hear that word and it scares them um but activism is 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 why we are here someone's thought about one single person thinking about something passionately enough can become a policy that's what that's what it takes it doesn't take necessarily a whole Congress or Parliament um, because those ideas also start with one person saying, you know what, we ought to think about this in a more serious way. And then maybe they activate another person and then the next thing you know, they've worked to activate a majority that then get something passed. And then here you are. Yeah, so. you said act locally, and you also said we're <laughs> fucking a lot of shit up. Can you zoom up <laughs> to the highest level and just, like, what's the? No, I mean, I agree. I but it just what's the what's the picture right now of, of of birds globally? What are the what are the trends line trend lines you see from from your vantage point? What are the the major? What are the biggest issues right now uh, uh, facing birds? How do they relate to 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 people? What what are the what are the big things you see at the macro level right now on on we, birds? We've objectified we've objectified birds into oblivion. 
we're objectifying them into oblivion. So we're counting them. We're, we're watching them. I mean, bird watching, birding is one of the most popular outdoor avocations in North America. They say 45 million Americans identify as birders. Okay, so, so think about that. Yeah. Think about that now. If you said, even if you said, take half of those as activists. Think about how powerful that would be. It would be larger than most, almost any other activist or lobbying group. If you had those people... No, no. Let's take a tenth of them, right? And and think about what four million people, four and a half million people could do. But way too many of those people are just satisfied with watching and saying, I saw, um, and not telling other people maybe how it made them feel and why it's important. So to, you know, to zoom up, we've just sort of um, and when I say we've ob- we're objectifying them into oblivion, you know, birds have become something to, to just count. And we're counting them as, we, as they dwindle, but we're not doing enough to stop that dwindling count. Um, and, and so to zoom up, I think it's incumbent upon those organizations at a local level, um, <laughs> you know, the bird clubs, to not just be bird clubs. You know, how about a bird club sponsor a habitat project? How about a bird club join forces with a native plant society to gather seeds to restore native prairie? What's to keep, stop? Keep keep going. What's to stop? All these all these all these uh, things uh, sound so novel to me. What's to so, stop yeah. that from happening? What's yeah. to stop a bird club from planting? a pollinator garden alongside a community garden Mm. so that there is room for butterflies and bees and other pollinators. I don't know, maybe an eastern kingbird drops in there, you know, during migration. But people are there gathering food, whole foods without having to pay whole foods prices. They're there gathering whole foods, a community, and they're surrounded by nature. Kids get to see butterflies. They get to learn that bees aren't things to be terrified of, but they are there are they are important components of of who it is that they are. They actually get to plunge their hands into soil and get dirt under their fingernails and to learn that it's not something that's yucky, Mm. you know, and all of a sudden you have. You've got hands in the soil, you've got eyes on butterflies and bees, maybe you hear a bird, and you get to taste an actual summer-grown tomato. (laughs) You know, and then you connect all that stuff. Nothing tastes better. Right. Yeah. And you connect all that stuff, and guess what? That's activism. So, you know, I I just think, you know, the large organizations... uh, What's happened with them is they've become, I mean, they're, they're, they're so member driven and so dependent upon the dollars that people are willing to pay them to mostly administer. You know, I think that's, you, you, so back to your earlier question, Neil, one of the things that you got to do is you got to ask questions of the people that you're giving money to, what are they doing with your money? Yeah. So for every dollar you give, how much of it goes to whatever? That's why, you know, whether you're a hunter or not, um, I tell people, purchase a duck stamp. You know, a duck stamp is $25, but 98% of that duck stamp... What's a duck stamp? um, It's a migratory waterfowl stamp. It's a literal stamp that duck hunters have to buy in order to, to legally hunt ducks, but anybody can buy one. But if you buy that thing, you're giving money back to conserve wetlands, not just to kill ducks. Some people say, oh, that's a license to kill. No, you have to have an actual license to do that. If you buy a duck stamp, a duck stamp alone is not the license to kill. A duck stamp means that you are supporting habitat conservation. You're supporting, um, you know, the, the, the refuge system here in the U.S., you know, I don't know what the equivalent of it is in Canada, but I, but again, I, I, I know there is an equivalent. So, but but thinking about how you can make little steps. Um, Twenty five dollars is a lot of money to some people, but um, 
I also see a lot of people carrying around phones in their hands that are costing them much more than $25 oh my gosh, a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, those are just... I wonder about yards, too. You know, I was reading it. Oh, gosh, yeah. It. Yeah, can, yeah. You can, people could change their yards. Oh, oh big time. Because you know? gra- grass is, 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 uh, is there, there's not I mean, much help. There, to, there, to, there are ways to, um, you know, to, to make habitat for birds, um, to, to, to be sort of a, a steward of your own postage stamp, of your own parcel that makes it better for birds. So whether they're migrating through or whether they're nesting there, um, you know, to keep your cat indoors, to, to, to do the best you can to, to do the best you can to be a good steward. You know, you can blow it up to... Cats uh, indoors is a big one. Yeah, yeah, cats, cats indoors. So wild, you know, outdoor cats killed something like... A bill is that true? A, a billion a song, a, 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 yeah, of songbirds. I, yeah, I like that. Yeah, billions. Um, I say a shit ton, right? <laughs> you know, I like that. And better. maybe it's yeah. a metric shit ton. <laughs> I don't know. Well, no one's counting all the dead birds, but there's certainly like you know what they say on the edge of the Gulf of Mexico, and all the hummingbirds get across there. There's all these cats waiting for them, waiting, right? Waiting to just take them out. You know, after they've lost half their body weight, flying across the Gulf of Mexico. When you you know when we go back to sort of the the span of a uh, use that is that my oh, there's a it's a northern mockingbird that was just back for a minute I was thinking it may have been my shrike but um and then that's an eastern kingbird on the other Drew's pause the now bird. here we're looking at a couple what kind of trees are those 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 are the that's a remnant of a peach orchard Peach orchard, uh, yeah, leftover so, peach trees, yeah, splayed sideways. Is yeah. that where you're looking for? You saw the mockingbird on yeah, there. Yeah, the mockingbird. So on this leftmost. Tree, oh yeah, at the top on the left yeah, it's there. It's up there about eleven o'clock, and then, oh look at uh, look at this tiger swallowtail. Look at that. Wow, butterfly. Yeah. Yellow and black fluttered by. Oh, look, look at that man. Just you know, yesterday, um, at the farm, I had done all this work. Right, I'd been out in the sun way too long sweaty funky and this spice bush swallowtail comes and lands on my eyelid to take advantage of the salt in my sweat and it just sat there right you know and in that minute it wasn't about any bird it wasn't about anything else other than that relationship i had with that butterfly kissing my eyelid wow let's jump in and we'll ride to another spot okay we're gonna get back in the car here, walking through the grass. Still wet, but not as wet. Some little moths are flying up here. My side of the, the Dodge Ram is in the shade. Drew's is in the sun. It's a lot of the conversation on, on this book, The Field Guide, is you know, we, we took it from oops, we took it from a place of uh, taking birders to activists. Yeah. But you know, I think a lot of people listening, as I bend over to grab this plastic bottle that fell out, um, might be trying to get from you know, non-birders to birders, non-bird watchers to bird watchers, and this guide is one thing. But I wondered if you could just, as we drive to the to the next destination, wherever you're taking us, if um, you could give us some of the tools. Like, you know, so if somebody's listening to this and they want to become a bird watcher, you know, is this the specific guide you'd recommend? A pair of binoculars you'd recommend? What 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 are the uh, is there a certain app? You had an app on your phone that was different than the one I have. You know, yeah, I have the I have the Sibley um, guide to birds. There's a lot of stuff there now. Ah, oh, look, the kingbird. See, the kingbird's chasing <laughs> that you, that collared dove. Look at it, and it's just it's almost because it can. It, it's just like <laughs> let let me. You know, that's to me. So, you know, as scientists, we're taught not to anthropomorphize, not to give human qualities to birds. Um, sometimes I ornithomorphize. I give myself bird qualities. Ornithom- or- ornithomorphize. Yeah, it's it's you know the direct opposite of. Um, you give. Say that again. What do you do? <laughs> I like this. Sometimes I give myself bird qualities, which is an assumption, right? I ornithomorphize. Ornithomorphize. And and, uh, And with the kingbird chasing the collar dove, you see. Yeah, look. This is not. Oh, I'm good. Thank you. My personal space, right? Um, 
so that kingbird is being selectively social um, and it just chooses in the moment not to have not to have a collared dove in its space um, and, and kingbirds are sort of that way uh, tyrannical they're they're tyrant flycatchers so <clears throat> they sort of live by that uh, that selectively social rule. This is all again still university. Um, so, so there's property. a sign there saying beef cattle um, research. Research. Yep. We just drove by. Now we're on. We're still on a two lane road. You know, there's a little cracks in the road, a little grass kind of popping through. The little thirty mile per hour zigzagging road sign. So the trees are very tall on both sides of us. So we're in kind of a quite shady, even though the sun's come up now. Drew's just strapped in his his phone into the um, uh, little phone holder here. And uh, so you said you, app, app, binoculars, field guide, app, you know, binoculars, take, take you someone know, from, from someone's got, stuff. someone's got a couple hundred dollars. They want to become a bird watcher. Give me the, give me the tools of the trade. What, what's all the, right. First of all, um, go to a used bookstore, right? And you always, they're, they're always used field guides there. Maybe they're older. Maybe they don't have the most current uh, taxonomy in them. Uh, maybe they, you know, there have been splits and lumps in bird species since that field guide has been published. Pick it up. Pick up a $2 field guide, right? And while you're there, um, pick up a couple of others so you can give them out, you know, like Gideon's used to give out Bibles. Mm. Um, and, 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 and there's an activist move in itself. So pick up a used field guide. Mm -hmm. Um, Buy binoculars. Uh, you know, you can get a, a decent pair of binoculars for eighty, ninety dollars. So that's what. Right? What is that? You type in binoculars online, thousands come up. Yeah. So is there a certain some number, them, range, distance, brand? Anything? Yeah. You you want something in the seven by thirty-five or eight by forty, eight by forty-two range. Don't buy the 10 power binoculars to start off. Don't buy the 10X binoculars um, because you're going to have a hard time picking the bird up um, in a narrower field of view. So you want to have something 7 or 8X. 7 or 8 times closer to you. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's at least like a 35 millimeter or 40 to 42 millimeter binocular. That's the width of the frame? That's the width of the ocular. Okay. Right? Of the, of the um, objective, I'm sorry, that piece that's um, gathering most of the light. So first number should be 7 or 8. Mm -hmm. Second number should be between the 30s and 40s. Right. Okay. And you want something that's going to be comfortable to hold. You want something that's going to not be so heavy that it tires you, that it tires your arms out, that you you want to take it with you. Now, a lot of people will buy these tiny binoculars that are, say, like 8 by 24 or something like that. And those binoculars might be okay in full daylight, but in many times you're going to be in situations, say, in a park under... Um, in an understory. Let's say you're in a city park and it is late afternoon or late evening. You're going to have trouble seeing the birds because those small, that 24 millimeter um, doesn't objectives let doesn't yeah. let in a lot of light. So, so the, the used field guide you know the binoculars, the, the eighty-five, ninety-dollar, hundred-dollar. We're binoculars. still under a hundred bucks. I like yes. this. Okay. Yes, it's cheaper than most people think. Right, and so yeah. there, and so there you go. Then this is free, but the most important thing, desire, um, and your desire just to see birds, to see a bird. Start with a bird. Don't go to trying to see every bird. Start off with a bird. Practice with your binoculars so that you're able to observe a starling. Look at that starling. Starlings are everywhere. Look at that starling, the spangling on its feathers this time of year. The yellow beak um, when they come into breeding plumage in the spring. 
watch a starling sing. Watch iridescent something. Yes, that iridescence is amazing. Watch them mimic other things, not just other birds, but starlings can mimic cell phones. They can mimic cars. Really? Yes. Wow. They are amazing birds. And as you say, when they change colors throughout the year, I mean, I saw a couple years ago, I, I took a picture of a bird, sent it to a friend. I said, what is this? It said it's a starling. It looked nothing like what I thought a starling was. Right. Like it just, it, it changed so much that I didn't recognize it. There so you go. starting to see that it's changing its colors throughout the year. So when you, you pay attention to the one, um, it prepares you to pay attention to the many. Yes. And um, you, you can't see everything at once. So see the everything in one. And when you do that, you begin to get an appreciation that takes you, will, will take you on this lifelong trip to bird by bird by bird. And, and then you get to know these birds in a more intimate way. You're, you're objectifying them less. Um, they aren't just objects to be listed or to be pinned. I, you know, I hate the whole thing. I'm gonna drop, someone says on eBird, I'm gonna drop a pin on this bird. And in my mind, I see this pin dropping and smashing this bird um, that everybody then has to go see because perhaps it's rare. Um, but, but when you, if you do go see that rare bird, think about that bird. It's been maybe blown off course from its normal migratory route. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about the snowy owl that you'd seen down here yeah. and how it was actually injured and you yeah, know, it, it, it yeah. Was... But, but watching somebody chase that bird so they could get a better photograph of it. The bird was emaciated. Um, the, the bird was thousands of miles from where um, it, it, it should have been, but this person didn't care anything about the bird's condition. What they were most concerned with was this bird's position on their list or the photograph of it, and so they just kept chasing it. So you're, where do you stand on like the Merlin app then? Because for me, for a lot of people, that app, the Merlin app has, has is the is a foothold. You know, especially the sound ID and the, you mm -hmm. know, the identify. I mean, for me, that's what I used to identify my first house finch, and and you know that app was a big helper. It's a it's a big helper. It's a pr very it's the most prominent app in birding. It's it, totally it free. Is. It is. But it's run it, by a, a school. But what it cannot become, um, it can be a help. I don't think it should be the whole thing. Um, it you know, has I've, the potential to play the calls too, which I'm you, sure you probably... Yeah, yeah you you know. did try minimize that because it stresses birds out. But um, sometimes uh, what I'm seeing some people do with Merlin is they just take the Merlin out and they don't watch or listen. They become sort of dependent. Yeah. On, on that instead of learning. So this is in part, again, what Leopold, I think, <laughs> very presciently sort of was referring to. If, if I don't know, it's sort of like auto driving, right? If, if I was able just to take my hands off the wheel um, and talk to you and just let the car drive and... Um, Maybe you have confidence in that. I'm not there yet. I'm not fully confident in letting, um, when I can do a thing, just giving it over to someone else. Yeah. Because that's also the opportunity um, for, and maybe I'm just a control freak. Me. No, no, no. I mean, but, it's, but it's, I, it's I, an like, unusual thing <laughs> to, to, to be auto driving right now. I mean, it's just, know, I'm not there yet either. It, it's I don't so, want to Tesla. You know, or, right, or, or so, well, that's a whole other story, and I will never buy one knowing who that megalomaniac is. Um, but, I, you know, the, the, the other part of it is, how do we learn? How, are we, how do we learn if we allow somebody else to think for us? And, and so, a, a big part of, of what I advocate for something like Merlin is to use it, but then verify. Um, you know, it tells you that it's a house finch. Okay, don't just take Merlin's word for it. Go and listen to recordings of house finch, house finches. Not don't just listen to it from the Merlin app or from Cornell. 
go and, and listen to other variations of House Finch song. So, and see this? This, where you see all, that's all, well, it's clay. But this used to be a big hay field. To our right, or yes, to our right. yellow construction vehicles over red dirt. And, and it used to be, that was a place where th there were meadow larks, there were dick thistles there, I've seen bobble links there, and now the, 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 the only thing that's there now are those big yellow bulldozers over red clay, wow. and pretty soon it'll be a housing, it'll be housing, it'll be a housing, it used to look like that. Mm. So, uh, you know, watching... Not to the, feel the tragedy when you're birding so much. It is. It is. It, it's, it's, a, um, it's a bittersweet thing, right? You know, you're out at a place like that and seeing birds, and then you go to the next place. And the, the, the rate of change is, um, is startling. You know, to see what was an open field one day in two weeks... Um, flattened and, and converted to uh, a future development yeah that's a that's a bittersweet part of this um, of this work the sadness makes me think of your last book I mean it's uh, we got to touch on it so I'm gonna mm -hmm. bring it up now so we can talk about it a little bit <coughs> By the way, the last thing I'll say about the field guide, I now advocate, um, and that de de that desire that I talked about as being free, that's what I call the feel guide, the F-E-E-L. Mm -hmm. So desire is your, your feel guide. And if you're employing your feel guide, then birds won't just be objectified, um, they'll be magnified. Wow. And if, you, if you're doing that, um, then you're going to become, you're going to act in the best interest of birds. You're not going to just count them just to put them on a list, but you're going to count on them um, to, 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 to make you and the world around you a better, a better place. And that, and that just happens, right? You, you find yourself working on behalf of something that you feel for much more than if you just sort of put it into this place of an object. And this, the, the line of thinking you've been on the last few minutes is really inspiring. It reminds me of page 24 of The Home Place where you wrote in your memoir of your grandmother's yard, Ma Mamatha's yard. Mm -hmm. It was a universe where wonder and awe had yet to be tossed from the temple by science and cynicism. I was just curious, you know, uh, how we tap back into that awe you described. It was a universe where wonder and awe had yet to be tossed from the temple by science and cynicism. You know, awe begins in child's mind. I mean, awe is what stops you at a puddle that appears, um, and, and, and magically almost, there, there are tadpoles there, and you're like, oh my God, what are those little black things swimming around in there um, and they look like commas and so I like to think of them as you know the, the it's life that gives you pause at a puddle mm. and there you are and that's awe because then you go from there to trying to find out you, you then learn that there is not spontaneous generation you learn that there is sexual reproduction um, it's not the birds and the bees that are teaching it to you it's you know these tadpoles and learn about frogs and and so from from that observation um, you become a naturalist and then maybe you 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 take a tadpole or two in a jar and you watch them develop and you learn about metamorphosis and guess what you become a scientist but then you begin to worry because you go back to the puddle and you see it drying up around the edges or you see maybe where a car has driven through it and then you're concerned about the welfare and the well-being of those tadpoles and of their world, the puddle. And guess what? Then you become a conservationist. <laughs> so, you know, th there are very simple things, Neil, in, in observation to go that take you from observation maybe to obsession, um, but maybe to profession. 
and in all of these things as you do them with birds or butterflies or boulders or bees there is a way of being that takes you to a place of feeling and you know so for for Bodsworth in, in the book that, that we're about to talk about yeah. you know that was part of the beginning for me it was a, a bird that used to be that is no longer Last of the Curlews by Fred Bodsworth published by Cower McCann in 1954 that elegant introduction it's a solid dark forest green cover with the drawing of a, a bird called an Eskimo Curlew on a grassy hill with a second one below it Bodsworth was a Canadian writer thanks by the way for picking one of my <laughs> countrymen and former president of the Federation of Ontario Naturalists he lived from 1918 to 2012 this book is set in the early 20th century he tells a fictionalized story of a solitary Eskimo curlew's perilous migration and search for a mate. The lone survivor comes to stand for the entirety of a species on the brink of extinction and for all in nature that is endangered. This one is 813.54 for North American 20th century literature. Drew, as you keep going on this on this beautiful kind of, it's a meditative and poetic uh, conversation we're having. Tell us about your relationship with Last of the Curlews, about a bird that is now considered extinct by Fred Bodsworth, published that, in 1954. That book um, that I actually first saw, it was... Um, as a cartoon on an ABC after school special when I was probably in the third or fourth grade and we're crossing over Lake Hartwell which is one of the hydroelectric lakes um, but so I saw this cartoon um, that just I was transfixed right to see the story of this one bird and its migration and to see um, what had happened to all of the other curlews, I then found the book in the library, and um, and I think, I know, <laughs> that at that point, I, I became concerned about other birds that had been driven to extinction, or that were in danger of becoming extinct, and so, what last of the curlews put in my mind was this whole idea of of conserving a species, of thinking about how a species um, could be imperiled to a single individual. Because here was this, this curlew that Bodsworth had written about, and it was down to a single bird. Yeah. And, and, and Eskimo curlews at one point in time were super, super abundant. Yeah. But here it was a bird that was down to one. And, you know, it's it's no different than, than passenger pigeons, perhaps one of the most, or the most abundant bird on earth at one time, that was whittled down to a single bird named Martha that died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914, or Carolina parakeets, you know, our only um, native eastern parakeet, at least, that was, was whittled down to a single bird named Uncas who died in the Cincinnati Zoo in Because Because of hunting? Um, because of a number of factors. Um, passenger pigeons were, were hunted out um, in part. I mean, people would, uh, in a single shot, you could bring down a dozen passenger pigeons. They were so abundant. And people would, would shoot flocks all day. Technology had a lot to do with passenger pigeon disappearance because um, as telegraphs came online, um, as railway systems became more sort of uh, widespread, people were able to telegraph the location of a pigeon roost and people would hop a train and they would go there to kill birds. Um, you know, for Eskimo curlews, these were birds that were hunted out. They were, um, they were considered tasty right and they were easy to kill and so people would would shoot them um, they would sell them on the market in, in New York and Chicago and elsewhere and um, and and so these are birds that look, look at that that's a red-shouldered hawk up on that wow. bale of hay isn't that yeah this gorgeous just flew up and as we drove by onto a bale of hay <laughs> So, you know, 
greed is um, probably foremost, and you don't frequently see it written that way. People talk about habitat destruction, they talk about hunting, um, but they seldom list the human motivation, not the, 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 the motivation, what, what creates, what drives things to extinction isn't, um, it, it, at the root of it is avarice. Um, is greed, is is this human desire um, to think about only human desire, not to think about what other beings need. Um, and so greed, um, selfishness, all of those things to me are at the root of, of extinction, of Eskimo curlews or passenger pigeons or or many other things. So this is, uh, look at, see the white birds out there? Yes. Herons and egrets. Unfortunately, I can't stop on this bridge, but this is um, Little Beaver Dam Creek. <clears throat> and so we're in Townville now. And, and fortunately for Townville, there's not much of a town. <laughs> there are chicken houses and cattle ranches and, um, and lots of sort of edge habitats for, for, for birds. And so <coughs> this is a hot spot. Um, it's a place where, um, a good many birders come to see lots of different kinds of birds. I've been coming to Townville now for gosh, 30 years. What makes a hot spot a hot spot? Um, habitat, um, and where you have lots of habitats that are sort of butting up against um, one another, um, it creates a lots of edge, lots of ecotone. What, what do you it mean does. edge area? What does that mean? Um, just the... You're from Edgefield. Yes, I'm from Edgefield. Edgefield County. Edgefield County, which is about two and a half hours south of here. Edge is just the transition. Um, it's where one thing ends and another begins. So... Um, that transition from one thing to the other, that's the edge. And that's good for birds. That's, that's good, generally good for birds. And maybe good for other people too, other yeah, things. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's. People edges, like to live on the coast. Edges tend to be rich, <laughs> right. Edges tend to be rich places. The forest, the, the, the yes, edge of the forest, the edge, edge of, of the, the river. The edge of the forest, um, the, like a horned lark maybe. The edge of the forest, the edge of the river, you know, where this um, sorghum field meets the forest over there is where deer will feel safe coming out into that edge. Right. To, to look, feed. That's, you know, <laughs> chapter but, 59 of three books, we interviewed a guy named Jeff Speck, an urban planner, and he said that that's the behind the design of good city planning is that it feels like the buildings are low enough that you feel like you're at the edge of a forest where it's mm. tall, you know, huge condos. People don't feel good there because they're looming. And, they're, yeah. you know, he was talking a lot about that. He's talking about that in his book, um, Walkable City. It makes me think of that. How much of how much of what we like is is sort of baked into our roots? It is absolutely yeah. I like yeah baked in. Um, and, you know that's part of. Pick up your phone there, just fell. You. Yeah, just. I buy down. your Red Bull can. Yeah. <laughs> well, I had Red Bull this morning instead of coffee, so. Um, I you know I think that that's part of what we don't realize is just how much is baked in. Um, just how much of who we are as beings, as human beings, um, is related to who we were um, in our evolutionary history. And, and part of what we are doing now is we're short-circuiting our own identities by not being in nature, <clears throat> by not recognizing nature, by not understanding where our food comes from. Um, by being willing <laughs> to just to, to manufacture what what we eat in ways. I, I was looking at this thing the other day and you know that that, that people are, are essentially growing meat in labs. Um, what does that mean really? You know it's well it, I'll tell you what it means to me. It sort of takes me to that um, the, the, the movie 
that horrified me as a kid, Soylent Green. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and if and if we don't understand where our food comes from, um, then then I think we're we're lost. And 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 so you know, part of the the, the, the Eskimo Curlew's demise was because people were shooting it for food, but they weren't it wasn't sustainable <clears throat> people weren't thinking about anyone else but themselves and so they just killed 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 um, until there were no more to kill <clears throat> then they moved on to the next thing what, what are they on now oh gosh um, which birds are at the precipice <sighs> you know the, the birds, at least in, in this country, that are, are on the precipice, <laughs> it's almost easier to say what's not. You know, there, there are so many uh, eastern bluebird right there. Yeah, the, blue tail uh, flock. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a bird that's, that's doing relatively well because, in part, we recognized, I mean, people had an affection for eastern bluebirds. I was going to say, it's pretty. It's pretty. It's, you know, it's a it's a charismatic uh, bird. And so people put up houses. They sort of had the whole idea that, oh, this bird lives in a house with its mate. And it's faithful to its mate and blah, 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 which is not true. Yeah, you said That's that in a, your book that... It's a human construct, right? Yeah, we well, think birds are monogamous. Yeah, yeah. They're not. There's, n- n- most aren't. Well, are, yeah. are any? <laughs> yeah, they're... Well, I mean... If, if, we're, if we're basing it sort of on the human construct... Um, th- yeah, there are a few. Um, you know, waterfowl will pair off. Um, some waterfowl will pair off during the winter and will be relatively monogamous raptors. These but are for then, a season you're talking yeah, for, about. Them. Yeah, for yes. But but then some some of these science has helped us understand these mating systems for some birds that maybe are marked or recognizable as individuals and we can say, oh, these individuals are together again. But it's only when we see them or for only what we surmise as um, for, for, for our context and so I'm always I always sort of shy away Dr. Gawadi, Patty Gawadi um, as a scientist one of the things that she taught me was you know we make these assumptions um, about, about creatures, people made the assumptions about the male bird singing to attract the female bird and um and, and we've learned pretty recently. I mean, we knew things like fe- we knew that female cardinals sing, but sang. But until women began to be published, have we understood that female birds sing as well, and and in much more variety than we once thought. So that kind of research shows us sort of back to this whole idea of the prism through which we see nature. Yeah that maybe there need to be more of us out there observing so that everything isn't biased through one particular prism. Um, So that if more people are out there watching, maybe those who would be greedy enough to push things to extinction have eyes on them as well and they're less likely to do it. you know, I, I think again, it's Neil. It's a matter of you know taking um, taking taking birds or taking nature seriously enough so that you feel something for it, so that you have a relationship with it. Um, and if you have a relationship with it, you're going to feel something for it. If if you feel something for it, you're going to do something for it. Um, you're going to care for it. And, and that's that's conservation, and and birds just happen to be the way that that I and many of us sort of you know translate conservation and wildness into ourselves. Um, you you can't possess wildness um, any more than you can possess the wind. You may think that you can harness it um, until it comes and knocks over trees and and twists buildings into into warped rubble 
So I, I think accepting nature in a way um, that hopefully, you know, we take part of the Hippocratic Oath first to do no harm. Um, try to do try to do your best by nature so that there's nature left for others to nurture. So and, and, and that's, you know, for me, all of that comes through birds. It comes through, you know, being out in these spaces and and, and watching and wandering and all of that. It seems like nature is making itself more known now. I mean, very quickly. I read a book called Fire Weather by mm-hmm. Jean Vallant recently. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of the erratic weather that we're having and smoke, the smoke that's covering New York City all the way up <laughs> down from Quebec. Yeah. And, you know, uh, more tornadoes than where I live in Toronto. You know, it's, 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 it, it, there's a, a, there's a quickening of, 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 of nature that seems to be happening all of a sudden that's I'm sure a function of lots of oh. decades of, of our you know taking from nature not measuring quantifying being able to calculate its value or worth and now suddenly we're experiencing it in whole new ways yeah you know it, it feels I mean as long as we've been human beings right we've been changing nature but then it feels like there have been certain triggers and you know <laughs> The, the, a big trigger was industrial revolution, right? And we and, and, and people began to figure out how to build more, um, how to make more, and, and while at the same time exploiting other human beings. Uh, is... That's an area we haven't gone deep into that you're you're really well known for. You know, you got the call for the MacArthur Genius Grant. I had a question to ask you about how that went. Do they send you an email? <laughs> um, do they, yeah, do they, they send well, you a letter? Well, how does that even work when you get they, that? They, Yeah, I got an email um, that wasn't, I mean, it didn't say he won. It just said, you know, we've, we, it was sort of thinly disguised or maybe very well disguised as, you know, we saw your presentation and were very interested and wanted to, <coughs> wanted you to consider working with us. Um, on on some of your some of your interests, and uh, I, I kind of ignored it for a day or two until. <laughs> I found Who are these people? It. You're right. I'm like and the then Arthur I saw, Foundation. And I was like, oh, well, maybe this is a way to get in good with these people, and they'll begin to think about you. For I didn't know. I mean, you can't work for a MacArthur not consciously. So you can't apply for these you things. Can't, can't apply. Yeah. You made it. Um, you were worried about hitting that butterfly? Yeah, yeah. Well, There's a butterfly that just crossed in front of us, I, and you slowed down. Yeah. <laughs> Not like many people butterflies. slow down for a butterfly. I like I, this. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I don't I, I don't like hitting them or killing things, so... Uh, you know, unless I'm trying to... You're not going to gonna eat that I'm butterfly. Not, I'm not going <laughs> to eat the butterfly. Um... Do you get a letter from MacArthur Foundation yeah, and then, that says and, we'd like to we'd and, like to uh, hang, then, talk to we'd like to yeah, be your friend? We, we, yeah, and then I get a call because I said I had just come off of a the thing I was doing at a museum, so I wrote them back and I said, sure, um, but I can't talk today because I'm a little bit off grid and and I didn't really feel like talking. And at the again at the time, I just thought maybe they wanted to work together, and there was no timing involved and the next day they called or someone I got a call from Chicago and I just and my phone said Chicago Illinois and I was like oh spammer and I <laughs> then they called again and left a message and they said you know this is the MacArthur Foundation we wanted to speak to you about some collaborative work please give us a call still not telling you that you want anything nope okay and then, okay and then I called and still I was like well I gotta go pick my wife up and so can I talk to you while I'm driving and they said no we'd rather you not um, and then I was like what the hell's going on here and then they said um, we're calling not about collaboration but for congratulations we're, they said wait 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 they said this after they said the collaboration the first two yeah, times yeah yeah then finally they they I guess they were sort of tiring of me putting them off <laughs> And they said, congratulations, you're a 2022 MacArthur Fellow. Um, and 
boom. Uh, and then I just sort of went limp and uh, unintelligible and so this is the MacArthur Genius Grant. They yeah. award, I don't know how many a year. Not very uh, 25. many. 25. 25 a year. It comes with a pretty good check. Yeah, 800K now. $800,000. They, they, they don't say how you gotta sp- how you can spend. You, what, yeah, like, it's, it's unrestricted. Unrestricted? Yeah, except for Uncle Sam claiming his part. You gotta it, pay taxes on it. Right. But you, so you don't get it all at once. But you're declared a genius yeah, publicly. Uh, I, I, know it's, I know it's unofficially called. We've had a, we had George Saunders on in uh-huh. Chapter 75. A MacArthur uh, um, winner as well, and, and I didn't go deep into asking him kind of how that felt. So you went, you go limp. He, I think he said when he won the the book race that I was struggling for purchase. Yeah, which is a great. I thought that was a great phrase. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, because you, and and I think the genius of the MacArthur is that they tell you, you know, this. We have no expectations of you other than just to continue doing what you do, but. Part of what happens is you don't believe it. You, you're sort of at this point of um, trying to understand why me, and so then you sort of double down on what you were doing because you uh, want to be worthy of it. Right. Um, right. It, it, it adds to your own internal credibility of yeah, your work. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, oh, so I, you know, I mean, the money is great. Um, and it allows you to do things that, I mean, I, I could not have bought this farm if not <clears throat> for, you know, that, that money. So, you know, at least from kind of a, a tangible standpoint, I can go and I can, I can walk the 45 acres of this farm and say thank you to um, the MacArthur Foundation for... And it increases the prominence and notoriety of your work. I mean, it, it pushes every, it yeah. pushes everything you're doing out there. Your your viral article nine rules for the black bird watcher. I mean, I've seen that come across my feet a, a few different ways. Yeah, I read that article about you. What do we do about James Audubon mm-hmm. that you wrote for Audubon magazine? I thought that was a really really beautiful, wondrous essay. We'll put that Thank in the you. show notes for people. Thank you. What do we do about James Audubon? We understand who he was, and um, we see his art in that light. You know, it's it's funny to me. I was I was actually given a beautiful original Audubon plate of, uh, of a, a full size painting. Yeah, of Dick Sissel, and um, and I told people I'm not I'm not going to burn it. I'm not going to toss it. I'm going to hang it in the place where. When I look at it, I understand who John James Audubon was is not a good person, a brilliant bird artist, but he wasn't kind to birds. John James Audubon killed lots of birds so he could paint them. Um, And so it's important for art that you hang it in the proper light. And um, I think it's important for those people that maybe we have lionized and deified and held up as somehow um, superhuman that we hang, that we place them in the proper light. And that's that's what I say we do about John James Audubon or anybody else, that you put them in the proper light and people make their own decisions about who it is that they are. If you, if, if you want to continue to call an enslaver, um, and uh, a bloodluster, um, a hero, then that's your personal choice. Um, but, you know, I, I think my job, Neil, as a writer and an ornithologist and, um, and a bird watcher and a nature lover is just to illuminate, mm. is just to, to write as accurately as I can the science. Um, and then where my heart fills in in between those lines, people can take that for, you know, for what they want. So, yeah, I, you know, I've never, I haven't been into canceling anyone, um, but I'm, but I'm all about fully illuminating who it is that they are. Mm, I love that. It's a beautiful way to say it as you curl the, the the car back into the driveway dropped me off at the Clemson University Conference Center and in 
just had a couple beautiful hours birding, talking about nature, exploring what it means to actually, you know, embrace the land uh, in big ways. Uh, it's, a, it's a gift. It's a really g a big gift to spend time and talk about all these things. I do have a few fast money book questions for you. Yeah. As you drop me off of the hotel, because <laughs> you're gonna say you're a big book lover. It's really obvious in in, in, in your uh, in your work and in your writing. And just a couple questions on your on your actual books. Yeah. Um, so I got I got to ask first off: hardcover, paperback, audio, or e? Which do I prefer? Yeah. You know. Um, I like for people to. You know, I like to be heard. I think, you know, for writers, you write to be read, but ultimately you write to be heard. And so the audio, I think, maybe gives people a sense. Uh, they don't have to wonder about pronunciation or anything like that. And hopefully they get to hear the emotion that maybe doesn't come across with the words. Yeah. Did you read the home place? Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, I yeah. read it, but it's good to know. That. So people yeah, listening, you was, got you got to read Drew's. You got to listen to Drew's that was memoir, the, that the home was place. The, it's a wonderful the, book. That was the first time that I'd ever read the book through and through was when I read it in the studio. And it was hard. Uh, <laughs> the first day I did six straight hours of reading. And, um, and I was sort of worried that I had ruined my voice for the next day, but I, I didn't. But, um, yeah, I think, and I, and even though I read eBooks, there's something different about having a page turn that's not a scroll, right? Um, and so I like to have the heft of a book in hand. Yes, yes. You know, it makes a yes. difference to me. Yes. Um, it's just like the field guides. I still, and I, you know, I can't resist when I go in a bookstore and I see one of those little golden field guides. I still buy it. Two dollars that he used bookstore. Yeah, store. if I see Sand County Almanac, I I buy an extra copy or two and I give them to people. Um, so, but one of the the best things is to go into a used bookstore, and there's my book sitting beside a Sand County Almanac or some other book that I admire, and it feels like um, I'm part of a legacy. So, yeah. That's Sweet. beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> How do you organize your books on your bookshelf? Oh, gosh. Uh, you know what? Um, where they fit. <laughs> I, you know, I, I've tried to have all my field guides in one place, but then if I take a field guide down, somehow maybe it ends up... Uh, you know, I have... Th there's, there's, there's little rhyme or reason to it, really. I have one bookshelf where I have friends, author friends who are sort of together. Um, I try to organize my poetry so that my poetry is sort of together. That um, that the bird books regionally eh, kind of sort of together. But I also, Neil, honestly, I end up double and triple buying a lot of books because they aren't very well organized. Back in the day, I gave my kids, I said, and gosh, they could have made a good they could have made a nice allowance. I told them, I said, I, I would give you, I, I promised them, what was it? It was like a quarter for every book, right? And I wanted them to do a spreadsheet and everything and organize my books and they, and they passed on it. So now I, I guess that's up to me and I'm going to have to figure out how to organize them. But it sounds like they're pretty loosely organized though. You got them in, in groups and yeah, kind of sort of, I know where to go yeah. mostly to find a certain book. Any other bird poetry books you'd point us to? I mean, uh, Sparrow Envy was my first. Um, I'll, Joy is the Justice We Give Ourselves is my next book. And that's, that's the next book of poetry that's out. Um, in um, April of 2024. Um, you know, there are so many great poets. Joy is the justice we give ourselves. Yeah. Great title. Yeah, I've heard you say you. that phrase a few times. Yeah. It's, in other interviews. Yeah, and I, you know, birds are joy. And uh, watching birds is me giving myself joy. And, I mean, that phrase came in because um, after all those those nine people were gunned down in Charleston at that church I went out the next morning and I watched birds 
I didn't know how to deal with it otherwise. And so I went out and I remember watching birds and I, I broke down and I cried because <clears throat> I just didn't, I couldn't make sense of any of that. Um, but birds at least gave me <clears throat> space for that. Yeah. They gave me, they gave yeah. me space to think about the insanity of someone hating people so much because of their skin color that they would just end their lives after they had trusted them in their most sacred space. So that's that's when I came up with that. Joy is the justice we give ourselves because I can't depend on anybody else to give me joy, right? Um, and increasingly, unfortunately, you can't depend on justice um, in a system that has been built largely on the injustices that that some people experience so i take joy i take my joy with my justice mm. yeah you mentioned buying books a lot do you have a favorite bookstore alive or dead yeah you know hub city books i have to give them a shout out that's in spartanburg south carolina um never more books it's a great place in beaufort um, South Carolina? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, any bookseller, uh, any indie bookseller, but I love, I love, love, love used bookstores. Yeah. I love bookstores. There's this place in Greenville called Mr. K's Books. Okay. And I, I go in there, and it's 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 huge, but I always go in there, and I, I don't think I've ever come out of there without a book. Wow. Yeah, you that's know. a good. That's a good life rule. Yeah, never leave an independent bookstore. No, buying no. Something. But used books is there's just something about, and occasionally you'll find a book. You'll you'll get a used book and you'll open it up. And I love when people have used their books that they've written notes in or they've highlighted something. And Merry I Christmas, like, 1986. You know that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And you never know what you're going to find in there. So, yeah, those are. But I love used bookstores. Absolutely love used bookstores. Is there a white? Do you have a white whale book or anything? Any book you've been chasing for oh, a long gosh. time? Oh gosh. Um. Hmm. You know, actually, um, I and I finally fa I can't remember. I was looking for um, not the. I've I've got Last of the Curlews. Um, but I, I wanted the the cartoon, and for a while it was on YouTube, and then it disappeared. And if you can't be found on YouTube, you can't be found, right? <laughs> uh, and then finally, I found a recording on CD, and so that satisfied a little bit. You know, that was a little bit of a of a white whale deal. Um, what I would, you know, I love first editions, obviously. Yeah. Um, but probably the first edition, a first edition Peterson, mm. um, yeah, is is a book. And people have sent me. I've had people. I got a book one day. It was sort of this falling apart Peterson feel guide. It wasn't a first edition, but this was a book that someone had had since childhood, and that they trusted me with that book. They sent it to me. It was in a plastic bag, and it's like if you try to open it up, it like all falls apart, right? So, um, another metaphor. Yeah. And so you have to be satisfied with that book as it is, you know, it's just like a bird. You can't identify every bird cause they already know who they are anyway. Um, Osprey, you see it? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, what's the, how do you tell that? Uh, just kind of, well, first of all, how it's soaring, Yeah. but then the sort of crooked wings. Right. Right. Wow, it's so tiny in the distance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, we've talked about joy. We've talked about justice. We've talked about race. We've talked about nature. We've talked about conservancy. We've talked about a land ethic. We've talked about your formative books. Drew Lanham, to close us off, is there a final bit of wisdom or piece of advice you'd give to people listening who made it all the way to the end of this conversation <laughs> on how they can 
live with a bit more of a of a, of a land ethic or a, a, of a conservancy kind of vibe or a, a, a birder kind of philosophy? Is there any any sort of nudge you'd helpfully suggest or leave us with as we close off the conversation? Follow your feel guide. Follow your feel guide, and um, you know if, if heart is in front. Um, good can't be far behind. Thank you so much for coming on Three Bucks. <laughs> Thank you. Man. Hey everybody, it's just me, just Neil again, hanging out in my basement on the brown couch with a bunch of uh, duvets and blankets all twisted up here. It's just it's just been a rotating sick house uh, here. Um, with schools and my kids everybody's coming home with something you can probably hear my voice i'm a little bit stuffed up but i have really been enjoying listening back to that long meditative soulful conversation with drew lanham i was wondering at the beginning do i take out and try to snip out all these like you know long pauses and the the sounds and so but i thought you know what there's something really beautiful about slowing down into a paceful way of communicating and talking so poetically and philosophically like Drew is able to do. So I hope if you made it all the way to the end here, you enjoyed that and it maybe gave you what it did for me, a little bit of peace, a little bit of respite, respite, do I always say that word wrong? Uh, A little break from the fast paced and frenetic Uh, world that we live in. It is really nice to just sort of disappear into a whole bunch of grassy fields in South Carolina, hang out with the birds. How beautiful was it when the car turned off and we got outside, you could start to hear the bird calls. Oh my gosh, is he good at bird calls or what? There's a lot of quotes that jump out to me from this conversation, tons of them. I wrote down a few that I wanted to talk to you about. How about conservation means taking some and leaving some for later? That's one of those words I've heard since I was like in third grade, conservation. But just to put it in such simple terms, conservation means taking some and leaving some for later. That is just a wonderful conversation. It reminds me of the conversation we had um, with Heather McGowan. Because do you remember that book on the lessons of Luna we talked about? And uh, in that book, there was the story about how clear cutting, of course, takes away forests forever. It's the maximum profit way to kind of get wood from a forest. But in the hundred years preceding clear cutting in the Legacy of Luna book, what she talks about is how the organization that built the town that funded the cities and had to provide homes for people, they knew that you only took certain trees. You you took the old trees or the sick trees or the dying trees, or if you took a big one, you left another big one near it. And you you planned the forest because you knew you were going to be taking from it for 100 years. That's conservation, taking some and leaving some for later. There's something also in there about trust in general. Having the long view in mind is just so refreshing. I've always really admired companies that happen to be public, like for example, Walmart, where I worked for 10 years, but still have a majority private ownership share because Walmart was owned and is owned in a majority, I still believe, by one family. Uh, and the meetings that I was part of were, you know, the family or the representatives were present. They all kept saying, we don't care about the short term quarterly Wall Street motivations. It's all about setting the company up for the long term. And I'm not going to, you know, put Walmart on a pedestal here, but I'm just saying it's our short termism. It's the short term is a market driven approach that how often helps us make these poor decisions that are the opposite of conservation. So that was anyway, one of the quotes that got me thinking. How about this one? Birding is non lethal hunting. I had never thought of it that way. And I had always, you know, when I went birding and like, you could hear hunting shots, like I, I felt very far removed from people that were actually shooting the animals. But hearing Drew talk about how he shot and hunted turkeys but then didn't eat them because they you know they had legs that were like tough meat and then you couldn't he couldn't eat those and so he stopped hunting turkeys you know and now he's consuming the whole animal well there's just no way that whatever organic or grass-fed or whatever animal meat i'm buying from the grocery store is treated in anywhere close to that same level of respect and so Hunting is a way to get organic foods without going to whole foods. 
I believe was one of the other quotes he said. So yeah, there's something, doesn't that, uh, maybe you, I don't know where you are on the hunting thing, but growing up in Canada, like I don't, I, I've never met anyone who hunted. <laughs> I just don't know anyone who, who hunts. And um, so he's kind of propped open a little door in my mind on what hunting is and can be. And that relates to the larger conversation about like, for example, the land ethic, right? Um, and then finally, the quote, you can't see everything at once. So see the everything in one. You can't see everything at once. So try and see the everything in one. And any little thing that we encounter and we see one bird, one cloud, one blade of grass, a tree. I mean, it's hard to do this. We live in a society that pulls us far away from sort of being mindful in this way, but recognize that it's the product of so many years uh, of evolution, so many pieces of light and sun and wind and sky and dirt and animals. Like how many things had to come in place or for that to kind of be there? And if it is a little bird right in front of you thinking about it, it's like tiny beating heart and the blood flying through it. And what's that word he described for like a song box, not a larynx, but like a, that other thing in, in the, and in, there's just like, a lot going on, and I think that phrase was really powerful. You can't see everything at once, so see the everything in one. A huge thank you to Dr. Professor J. Drew Lanham for giving us three more books to add to our top 1,000, including number 618, A Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold. By the way, highly recommend this book. Got to check it out if you don't have it or don't know it. Number 617, The Golden Books Field Guide, or The Golden Books Guide to Field Identification, to Field Identification, hyphen, Birds of North America by Robbins A. All. And, and there's so many field guides, you know, I think probably the Sibley's Field Guide is maybe the most popular now. Um, and, you know, or you can go back to the Peterson Field Guide, but I like Drew's advice to just go to a used bookstore and pick up any field guide. The birds don't really change. Maybe some of their names change. And now there's new, there's a new law that just passed or a new ruling that just passed. They're going to take away any bird named after any person. So, so Cooper's hawks are gone because they are named after a person. And so they're going to be named after their, what they look like or whatever it is. So... Anyway, that, that, that's going to keep evolving, but the old field guy recommendation I thought was great. And then finally, number 616, Last of the Curl Use by Fred Bodsworth. The sad tale of the Eskimo curl you told from the perspective of the bird. And I want to add one asterisk on here as Drew and I were talking about which three books to add to our top 1,000. He did mention another book that... We already had, which is My Side of the Mountain by Gene Craig Hort, Craighead George. So that book first came to us via Ali Ward in chapter 113. It's number 670, 667. We're going to asterisk it again. It already has an asterisk on it. Who was the other person that picked that book? Who was the other person that picked that book? Neil, don't you know your guest's other picks well enough? My side of the mountain. Oh, yeah. Lenore Skenazy in chapter 127. So, Ali Ward, Lenore Skenazy, and J. Drew Lanham have all picked My Side of the Mountain. If you have not read My Side of the Mountain, which we did not discuss in this program, I highly recommend it. A wonderful book about the natural world. So, to Drew, to you, for hanging out in the pickup truck. It's not a pickup truck. In the Chevy truck, just driving around South Carolina at the crack of dawn. That was a beautiful way to spend the morning. Thank you so much for listening to Three Books, and thank you so much for hanging out with all of us here. All right, are you still here? Did you make it past a three-second pause? If so, welcome to the after party. Welcome back to the end of the podcast club. This is one of three clubs that we have for three books listeners, including the Cover to Cover Club. That's the list of people that have listened to every single chapter of the show or attempted to listen. And lots of you, by the way, are, are, have listened to this over the years, but email me. My email is at threebooks.co and tell me if you're in the cover to cover club so I can add your name. I'm starting a little list on threebooks.co to put your name up in lights. And then there is, of course, the secret club, which I can't say more about, but call our phone number 1833-RELOT for clues. Speaking of the phone number, let's hit the phones now. Hi, Neil. This is Colleen O'Rollins from... 
Seattle, Washington. And I just want to thank you so much for your books or your podcasts. Uh, I really enjoy it. Look forward to it every time and really just enjoyed the uh, Yo Han Hari episode. And I uh, wanted to give you my favorite books, uh, most formative books. Charles Richard Drew uh, biography I read when I was in middle school and I had to do a book report and I was not much of a reader and it just I mean, I feel like it formed my politics, my understanding of the world and other people. Uh, really amazing book. And he was the one who, um, he was a black man from D.C. and he discovered the way to store blood plasma. A really, really uh, important man in history, in medical history. And I don't know, and this biography was so good. And then I read The Thorn Birds in high school, which I remember reading the same book as my mother, and I thought that was so amazing. And I remember feeling really proud of myself, so that was pretty formative. And the other one, I think, was to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street by Dr. Seuss, which I remember reading as a little kid, and then walking to school and coming up with outlandish stories of why we were going to be late, and the stories were based on that book by Dr. Seuss. So anyway, those, that would be it. And uh, thanks so much again for all your hard work. And I love that there's no ads. Thank you very much. See you later. Thank you so much, Colleen from Seattle. I love that there's no ads too. And thank you, thank you for the shout out for chapter 121 with Johan Hari on deleting devious dogma and discovering deeper designs. That was a fun chat, and I really do recommend his book, Stolen Focus, for those that don't know it. I honestly have been keeping my phone in a K-safe. So I think it was that conversation where I first heard about it. The kitchen safe was invented by a guy originally to lock up his chocolate chip cookies. And now if you go to thekitchensafe.com and and buy the mini version, which I bought, the mini version, M-I-N-I, mini, not midi, um, it's I lock up my phone every night before bed in that in that box. And Johan was the one I think that tipped me off to that idea. So that was a great conversation. And what wonderful books. Thank you for sharing your three formative books. That's what the, anytime anyone wants to call me, leave me your three formative books. It's always so fun to hear the the diversity. Like Charles Richard Drew's biography. He you know, this is a guy that lived from nineteen oh four to 1950, I'm pretty sure the book you're talking about is called One Blood, The Death and Resurrection of Charles R. Drew. One Blood traces both the life of the famous black surgeon and blood plasma pioneer and the well-known legend about his death. On April 1st, 1950, Drew died after an auto accident in rural North Carolina. Within hours, rumors spread the man who helped create the first American Red Cross blood bank had bled to death because a whites-only hospital refused to treat him. Drew was, in fact, treated in the emergency room of the small segregated hospital. Two white surgeons worked hard to save him, but he died after about an hour. In her compelling chronicle of Drew's life and death, Spency Love shows that in a generic sense, the Drew legend is true. Interesting. One Blood. So that's that book. The Thorn Birds, which I can picture the cover of that book. Um, I love that you were reading it at the same time as your mom. So that's the book by Colleen McCullough. Only got... 12,141 ratings on Amazon right now. So it was published. Now, this is the 2003 25th anniversary edition. So it was published in 1977. Colleen McCullough's sweeping family saga of dreams, titanic struggles, dark passions, and forbidden love in the Australian outback. Okay, wonderful. The Thornbirds. And then to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street by Dr. Seuss. Wonderful that we get a Dr. Seuss book in there. Thank you, Colleen, for your three most formative books. Presented in 30 seconds, about um, one five hundredth of the length <laughs> usually takes me to have a conversation about formative books. If you were listening to this and you want to share your formative books, we would love that. Even one formative buff- book would be great. one eight three three read a lot R-E-A-D-A-L-O-T. Yes, it is a real number. Or you could just send us a voicemail over email. It'd be wonderful to have your formative book on the show and just spreading the love about books in general. Okay, and now it is time for a letter of the chapter. And this chapter's letter comes to us from Jackie. Jackie, Jackie, Jackie Roddy. Jackie Roddy says, hello, Neil. 
I'm writing this email first and foremost to thank you for three books and as a personal writing exercise. I am a cover to cover listener, we'll add you to the list, Jackie, and a repeat listener to episodes that have particularly intrigued me. Let me tell you three reasons why I adore three books. First, three books got me back into my love of reading. As a child, I was an avid reader, flashlight under the covers so I could read after lights out kind of child. Then somehow with work, children, travel, and aging parents, reading took the back seat. Now, however, I have a wonderful routine of reading first thing in the morning. This helps me dream during the rest of the day when the stressors of life are getting to me. Also, with reading again, I'm exploring so much more about this wonderful world, resulting in my work being deprioritized and positioned where it belongs, as a means to live life, not life itself. Second, three books provoked my sense of self. I don't always agree with your guess or your point of view. Good thing, too, or this would be one boring world, which resulted in me exploring further what I heard and really wrestling with articulating my beliefs. Often the different perspectives broaden my viewpoint and challenge my internal monologue. The resulting arguments that I have with myself often change my mind and sometimes validate that I am right. Either way, the discussions always stimulate my thinking and add to who I am every day. Third, three books was my savior during COVID. I am not an easy conversationalist, and have worked hard to be more social over the decades. The retreat and isolation into our homes could have set me back. However, three books kept me going. It was during COVID that I caught up with most episodes, and while sitting between you and your guests, I too was contributing. I know you didn't hear me, but trust me, the other walkers in my neighborhood heard me. Many of them smiled and nodded. Others quickly crossed the street, which honestly, in light of COVID, was welcomed. I am so very happy and grateful that you decided to continue with the podcast during the pandemic. I suppose a fourth reason might be that Three Bucks is providing an avenue for me to write a letter of thanks, further allowing me to express myself out loud. I originally wrote this letter with no intention of sending it along. Now I'm feeling brave and sending it to you without any expectation that you will read it, but still with the gut-wrenching thought that by releasing into the world, someone might read it. Take care. And once again, thank you to you and your family and three books and the three books team for continuing this quest. Jackie. Oh, Jackie, what a letter. Thank you so much. Now, listen, when you hear letters like that, everybody, that's, you know, don't because I, I know a lot of people are thinking like that letter was so good I can't send mine in we love all letters remember the original chapter one I said that's the mark of success of the show I don't have ads I don't check with the downloads I don't sell it I don't try to monetize it it's the letters that are the they are the fruit of the labor it just makes me so feel so great to think that Jackie was hanging out on the couch between us in this in this ride down in South Carolina and all the ones in between. It's just a wonderful note. Jackie, please send me a follow-up note with your address so I can send you a signed book, whichever book you want, to say thanks for the letter. I really appreciate it. And of course, letters can come as an email like this one did, or if you want to throw it up on any of the review sites like Apple or Spotify or anything, I do see all those and read all those, and I will use those in the intros going forward too. All right, and now it is time for the word of the chapter, and you better believe it's time for a word cloud. Here we go. Over to you, Drew. The periphery of that, a lot of hydroelectric lakes and jazzercise in frontier for a very long, you know, a burgeoning is in, in the chattel bequeathed is a populist get on the stump foment desegregated it's been co-opted eastern deciduous forest omnivorous option there what's contrived the wanton slaughter of birds is sort of willy-nilly curtailed they have a a, a, a syrinx i call it odd no orn- ornithological distracted disorder <laughs> i like it this lemony yellow breast with a black chevron you know when i looked at the sonogram i was like we've objectified birds into oblivion popular outdoor avocations i think it's incumbent upon those organizations not to anthropomorphize um sometimes i ornithomorphize the spangling iridescence it was emaciated very presciently megalomaniac is i was transfixed at the root of it is avarice it's a charismatic lionized and deified the heft of a book in hand There is a plethora, a cornucopia of words, a delightful words to choose from there. I'm going to go with, how did he say it? I want to get it right. Ornithomorpies. Ornithomorpies. So there is a word called anthropomorphies. 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 Which is to attribute human characteristics or behavior 
to a, and then says in brackets, God, animal, or object. Miriam Webster, do you agree with that? Miriam Webster says to attribute human form or personality to. So this newly invented word ornithrom ornithomorphize, oh gosh, I'm having trouble saying it, is to attribute to himself or to to humans bird-like qualities. I love that. That's a wonderful word. It's an invented word. J. Drew Lanham, you have full credit beside that word in the dictionary. And may we all take flight together, bustle in, stay warm together, inflate our feathers together, hang out and fly together, and always flock together as we do together in this conversation and together in three books. I loved this year hanging out with all of you on the full moons with the new pages and the occasional bookmark, hanging out and spending time with this beautiful community. It means so much to me that you're hanging out with me. I'm here with you. And remember until next time that you are what you eat and you are what you read. Keep turning that page, everybody. Have a wonderful, happy new year for 2024. I wish you I wish you tremendous love and peace and joy in your life. Take care, everybody. I'll talk to you soon.